Remuted everyone. Okay, cool. Now it's just you and me then. Okay, let's uh, flip back to this. Thanks everybody for joining. Uh, I expected actually to see more people in pajamas, but uh, I'm I'm really uh, really happy everybody made the effort to to dress themselves up nice for our call today. Um, it's a weird time, man. Um, we I've lived through uh, three. I've been an investor, I should say. Three, to, through three major downturns. Uh, this one's unique. Uh, I, I guess they all are, but this one's definitely unique. And I, I think it, it hits us all um, uh, kind of differently individually, but all collectively uh, in the same way. Um, so with that in mind, we're gonna kind of try to keep things as normal as we can and, and plug through this. We've been, uh, we spent a bunch of time thinking about risk mitigation what we would do, what we are doing um, to, to play both defense and offense in this market. And we've also been gathering, uh, you know, ideas that we've been getting from the investor community. Uh, myself, Matthew, and the rest of the Volition team were pr pretty well plugged in uh, across the board. So we've kind of crowdsourced as well as come up with our own stuff. So hopefully you guys find today uh, really valuable. Uh, you want to jump in there, Matt? Yeah, so basically, like, yes, uh, may we live in interesting times, right? It's, uh, yeah, I mean, these are very unprecedented times. And we're bringing, what we're going to try to do is we're going to try to bring this back as much as possible to real estate theory. Um, this, like, I'll preface what we're going to be talking about today. I know what's, everyone, what, what's on everyone's mind. Everyone wants to know what's happened to the market and, you know, is this a good time and all that stuff. We're going to approach this a little bit differently. Um, there's a lot of stuff that we can't control. And I think that's the scary thing with this whole coronavirus. Like we're all doing what we can, self-isolating, social distancing. But even on the real estate front, um, there's a lot of uncertainty and people are trying to figure out what to do. What we want to do is we want to reframe the conversation. We don't really want to talk too much of course, we have to talk about the market, you know, what's, what we see, what, you know, but really it's anyone's guess as to what's going to happen. Um, what we really want to talk to you about more so than anything else are those things that we can control. So there's a lot we can't control, a lot of external uh, factors, a lot of external forces. What we want to do right now is identify what is within our control and prepare ourselves uh, for whatever is going to happen. Um, so it's a little bit different than you, what you might be hoping for in terms of this conversation, but we hope that it's still valuable to you and for you. Okay. So oh, let's go to the next slide. Yeah. So who's Volition? So we still say thank you to Creeds. Uh, I don't, I don't know if you guys uh, are aware they're still open, uh, especially in this crazy time. We're trying to continue to support our local businesses. They are still open for takeout coffee and, and dry cleaning because dry cleaning has been deemed an essential service. So uh, uh, please visit them if you're in the neighborhood. Yeah, so I mean, for those of you who haven't joined before, um, I mean, we're up to 90 now, 89. So there might be a few of you who haven't been to one of our meetups before. We actually do do these in person, right? Um, we meet once a month, we talk about the, you know, the most pressing issues that are relevant and important and interesting to investors. And we try to give market updates and we go, we do cool things. We go on street smart tours. We just held our first annual uh, quick start event um, about a month ago where you know, 100, 150 people came together to learn about the fundamentals of real estate and learn about how to invest in the Toronto market. There's lots of cool stuff we do. Um, but anyway, Creeds is a place that we meet once a month. So if you uh, are so inclined, who knows when this is going to lift, but you know, eventually when we get back to it, this is where we're going to meet. Okay. So who's Volition? So Volition is a, a real estate investment firm. Um, we are Toronto's uh, real estate investment experts. Um, we focus exclusively on Toronto. Um, we, we are more than just realtors. So we have an advisory arm. Uh, we have a, uh, you know, I, actually, I'll let Ming speak to this one. Ming, like, Ming, like, Ming speaks to this better than I do. 
<laughs> um, I'm just bored I of saying the, it. <laughs> the, 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 the long and short of it is uh, we talk the talk. We, we, we talk the talk, we walk the walk. We are investors first. Uh, we started all off as investors. We became agents and we made it a business out of it. But we started as investors uh, first. And we all have our, our individual stories and we, get, we can talk about that. But um, that's really the important thing to get out of this. Uh, next slide. Uh, and, and our company is broken up into four areas of service. The first one is advisory, which is exactly like what we're doing today. It's the figuring out uh, the strategy when times are tough. It's figuring out how to take advantage of a good market. It's figuring out how to get you to retirement, if that's your goal. Uh, and it's running these kind of uh, sessions and seminars. Uh, the next thing is the realty side, and that's actually finding these properties. Uh, I was speaking with uh, a prospect a couple of days ago, and uh, you know they had been working with a, uh, a realtor for the last year trying to find a triplex, and they haven't found anything. And I was like, we closed on, you know, a ton of properties last year. They may be difficult to find, but they are definitely out there. Um, so that's, that's what we do in the realty side. We specialize in finding and making uh, investment properties work. The next portion is renovations. If you guys are, you know, understand how real estate investing works, you know, oftentimes real estate investing strategies involve some sort of renovation, some sort of forced appreciation, to, uh, you know, to really capture the value that's in that property. Uh, so that, you know, we offer that service as well. And then lastly, we offer property management just so that way you're not um, caught up in managing the property itself and you're able to hand the property management over to us and you can continue focusing on being the investor. So the idea here is that we strive to not only be a service provider, we want to be a solutions provider. We want to, we provide all the services that you need under one umbrella to be successful. The only thing we don't do is financing. That's why we got another guy on here <laughs> on this call. Um, okay. Next slide. Um, and we also, you know, we do normal stuff. We put this up on here because it's really important. Your primary residence is one of the most important tools in your investment portfolio. It's going to be the one you can get lending on. It's going to be the one that, you know, the bank's going to give you the best rates on. It's the one that, you know, the, if you have like a rental suite, that that's definitely counting, those rents are counting towards your mortgage qualification. Um, it's really key to have your primary residence set up properly, which is why we do a lot of uh, what I call normal agent stuff. You wanna go to the next slide, Matt? Oh, we do a lot of normal agent stuff, but we just do it better. <laughs> yeah, and you know, especially like, you know, what we'll get into some strategies later and those strategies may involve selling for you. In that case, it's really important to make sure that you're working with people who know what they're doing uh, because it, the market, market is not um, easy buyer's market now. It hasn't switched over. Uh, it's, it's still a seller's market, but who knows what may happen in the future, but you wanna be able to make, you know, whoever your team is, you wanna be able to make sure that they're able to execute on both sides. Yeah. Okay. What the hell, sorry. And this is, uh, this is our, our favorite diagram we always throw up here. This is basically what we're trying to do. We're trying to be this eraser in your life to push through uh, the complicated journey that is real estate investing. Uh, because it is, you know, there's a lot of people on the call today who are longtime investors, and it is a complicated, difficult thing. Um, you know, we, we all kind of wish we had ourselves, you know, 10, 15 years ago when we started. Yeah. So, I mean, basically this maze today is coronavirus. Tomorrow might be something else. Yesterday, it was something else, right? Um, we try to keep abreast on whatever is relevant to you and we try to help you through the difficult journey, right? So, um, I alluded to this earlier on. Um, we have a private Volition Mastermind group chat on WhatsApp. If you're a client of ours, uh, who have completed a transaction with us, or if you're an advisory client of ours, then you'll have access to this chat. Uh, this is like a self-help group. This is a mental support group. This is many things. <laughs> um, but yeah, there's lots of valuable stuff on here. People are sharing tips and tricks. Um, people are sharing uh, their difficulties. People are sharing solutions. Uh, it's a valuable place to be if you want to be part of our community. This is not going to be as relevant today, but uh, Chris and, and Florence, and uh, I think we should throw Vinay up there. I, I forgot to put his, uh, 
that, that means we got to get his uh, his tag. mug. Yep, yeah, and his mug shot. But uh, yeah, these are when when you do eventually come uh, to an in person meeting. These are friendly faces who clients of ours uh, who be, who have become friends uh, who are friendly faces and willing to greet you with a smile and answer any questions that you might have. Cool. And, um, you know, we'll, we'll capture this again at the end, but we offer a 60 minute, 60 minute complimentary advisory consultation. Basically we go, we talk about what you're, you know, where you are today, where you want to get to and help build a plan uh, for you. And, you know, anytime somebody ever tells you, Oh, like this is, this is the best investment or this is the best investment. And they haven't sat down and understand, understood, you know, what your goals, objectives, what your risk tolerance is. They're, that, that is not the right answer, right? You really, investing is very personal. Otherwise we'd all be buying the exact same thing. Uh, and as much of, you know, the same thing as we could. Um, so we offer this, it's complimentary, 60 minutes. If you're interested in understanding how to, you know, begin, expand your real estate investing, uh, send us an email at uh, info at volitionprop.com uh, and we'll schedule a time with you. Yep. Ming's cool. Market Minute. So we're skipping this uh, because I wanted to leave a little more time for the coronavirus stuff. There's a lot for us to cover today. Um, one thing I will touch on very quickly, uh, if you keep going, Matt, to the news article. Oh, hi, I, just um, wanted to, I just want to interject quickly. When uh, there's this one time Ming didn't show up at the meetup, so I left these slides in, but instead of skip, I wrote, Boring. <laughs> uh, okay. So this was published two days ago and the, the market right now is so dynamic. It could be very different two days from now. It could be the same two days from now. It could be different two weeks, you know, two months. We don't know. But what we can tell you is what we're seeing right now in the Toronto market. And the foot is, the, you know, the, the foot's come off the gas a little bit, but it hasn't been, I think, what a lot of people expected, myself included. I expected, you know, the coronavirus news and the isolation to really put a damper on the market. Um, but, you know, prices are continuing to trend up and sales are continuing to trend up. Now, in comparison to uh, what we saw, you know, week before that, two weeks ago, it is, it is slowing down. And I expect that we'll continue to see, you know, some sort of dampening of the market. Uh, but it is not a uh, free for all where everybody, it, you know, can, can buy freely right now. That's just not the reality of the market that we're in. Um, there's so much pent up demand in the Toronto market. And people who have the money and the means to execute on an investment or they been looking to buy a house to move into, they've been ready for a long time and they've been trying for a long time. Um, so there's, you know, while uh, there are a number of people who are affected by the virus, there's also a, a fair number of people who are not. Um, not to say that this picture won't change in a couple of weeks, but right now this is what we're seeing. Anecdotally, I can say that, you know, about two, two weeks ago, we, I was in a multiple offer situation on two properties. One I had 24 offers on, the other I had 28 offers on. A week passes, I still have four offers and eight offers respectively. So it's not that the multiple offer situation is gone, but it has definitely slowed down. Yeah. You want to skip ahead there, Matt? Yeah. Is there anything here that you no. wanted to highlight? No. Same yeah. stuff. Okay. So what, what we, um, the way we broke this down, I d we didn't want to just give a whole bunch of like potential tips and tricks that you could use. Uh, you know, to, to prepare yourself and to prepare your real estate portfolio for COVID-19. What we wanted to do was break it into, what we've done is we've broken it into three areas. The first is, you know, I don't want to say the, the kind of the told you so stuff, but the stuff you should have already been doing. If you've been listening to us for the, you know, for the last couple of months, these are the things that we, we always tell our investors to do. So that's kind of the first category. Hopefully you've, you've listened and you've kind of set some of that up. The second part is a defense plan, which we've broken into three different areas. And what we're calling kind of like phase one, phase two, phase three defense, which is different uh, levels of severity when it comes to how much defense you need to play. 
there's some very simple stuff that everybody should be doing in phase one. Phase three is the tough stuff. Like if you are really in a bind, what should you be doing? And then lastly, we're going to talk about offense. In every, you know, in every market downturn, there is opportunity. It's not necessarily, you know, the, the, that everybody could execute on offense. Defense is the most important, you know, the saying is like championships are won with great defense, right? And, and investing is no different. Risk mitigation and defense is really important. The offense piece is for a certain, you know, segment of people who are able to execute on offense in this market. So let's, let's dive into it, Matt. Yeah. Uh, just, <laughs> just a, a a point here we uh, we hit 100 people which is our max and i'm my phone is ringing <laughs> off the hook right now with people who are like i can't get in i can't get in i'm like uh sorry dude what do you want me to do <laughs> uh anyway i thought it was interesting <laughs> okay so, so okay go go ahead our business model and any good investing model is based on a long-term strategy. And there will always be dips and bumps in the market, but it's about holding for the long-term. It's always about getting through the downturn to get through the other side. Unless you're of the belief that, you know, the, the, the world, the sky is falling and this is the end of kind of capitalism or, um, you know, free economic society as we know it. And there's some people who are saying that this is, this is it, this is, this is the end. If you, if you don't believe in that and you believe that, you know, we do recover over time, what it becomes important is being able to hold through that down period. We don't know how long that's going to be. We don't know if it's going to be three months, four months. We don't know if we're talking about a year, two years, but we know that. Event hey, Ming, you're on mute. Ming, 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 you muted yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Nope. Nope. Okay. I got kicked off. Okay. Um, so basically what we want to do is make sure that we're able to hold for long term. That's, that's going to be the most, most important thing. Um, you want to flip over the next slide, Matt, and go through kind of what we're seeing, uh, what we've yeah, seen sure. in the housing market over the last couple of years. Yeah. So basically, uh, I mean, this is, we all know, generally speaking, what this looks like, right? Uh, but, Oh, some of the, um, the years got cut off here. But basically, we all know what happens. Things go up, things go down. Things go up, go, things go down. Our job as investors is to weather the storms. We generally know things kind of like, right? We generally know things do this, but they don't just go up. It goes up and down, up and down, and up and down, just like this graph. This real estate is cyclic. There's going to be times that it's going to be up and there's going to be times it comes down. Your job as an investor is to hold, is to have a stable enough portfolio that operates consistently enough uh, and is stable to allow you to hold for the long term. Very, very simple, right? So what we want to be able to do is hold for the long term. This graph shows kind of like what's happened in Toronto over the X number of years. And we all know kind of what, what, it's, what it sort of looks like. And then we know that there's eventual downturns. So Ming, when you pulled this graph, what, what's this last downturn is 2017? Yeah, that was, uh, that was 2017. It was 20, 2017. So yeah. basically it, it comes down. And then if we continued this graph, we know where it is now, right? Can you see my cursor? Yep. It basically, it continues up. This, if, if we believe that real estate and the fundamentals, uh, we're going to talk specifically about Toronto um, right now. If, you, if we believe, like if you're, if you're one of our clients or you've been to our meetup or you've been to our event back on February 1st, we've, we taught exactly what we're ta uh, talking about now where, we, you know, things, things, eventually go up on an upward trajectory, but you just don't know what's going to happen in the short term in terms of it going up or down. So your job is to be able to hold over the long term so that this can, this can happen. And 
if you believe that Toronto fundamentally hasn't changed, and if you believe that Toronto still has the economic fundamentals um, whereby it will continue to perform um, based on the fact that we have uh, industry, we have jobs, that we have population growth and so on and so forth, then the fundamentals of the business model haven't changed. That's not to say the market's gonna be the same, the market might be different. But that's the difference between, do we get into this, Ming, uh, on the next slide, fundamentals and influencers? Yep. Okay, there we go. If we don't think Toronto has fundamentally changed, then the question is, is COVID-19, is coronavirus, a fundamental that's fundamentally changed Toronto real estate forever or is this an, an influencer insofar as it will have a temporary impact on the market I'm not saying short term I'm not using the word short term or long term because that is something we do not know right we do not know if it's short term or long term but what I am saying is is it fundamentally changing the economics that underpin the Toronto market, or is it something that's going to have just a temporary effect on the market? There's a very clear difference. For example, interest rates. For example, government interventions. For example, foreign buyers tax, right? So it's a volition belief that, that coronavirus and what's happening is a influencer. It will have a temporary effect on the market. How long? I don't know. How far will the market go down or whatever? I don't know. I don't know if you can see. Basically, if I draw this graph, there's going to be things see. like, you can't see? <laughs> you have a you marker? Uh, let me try. No? No. Okay, basically, things go up, things go down, right? What we don't know is this delta, how far it's going to drop, and we don't know how long it's going to be. That is, I know, that's the question on everyone's mind. How far is it going to drop? How long is this going to last? We don't have an answer. But that's not the conversation that I, I want to have today because I don't know, you don't know, no one knows. We're not, and on top of that, if the highest paid economists in the world don't know, then we're sure as hell not going to know. But the, what I'm trying to say is it doesn't matter. Uh, as long as you can hold through this downturn, then all you need to do is weather the storm so that real estate can continue to do its thing, right? So that's sort of a, what, we, what we're talking about. Like we, you know, we think that coronavirus is going to be just an influencer. It has, it's not going to fundamentally change the market. So like, Ning, like what, what are some fundamentals of the, of the Toronto market that we think are still uh, underpin the market? I think that, you know, the, the major fundamental that we're talking about are things that drive population to Toronto. And if, if coronavirus, for example, was a Toronto problem, that would be, could be a fundamental change to the Toronto market because then you don't want to come to Toronto because you could get coronavirus, right? Um, or if there's something about Toronto specifically that was changing and that would drive people out of Toronto. The problem that we're talking about here is everywhere. If I move from Toronto to Hamilton or Barrie or wherever it happens to be, I still have the same problem. The problem hasn't disappeared. Um, so it's not a localized problem, which is one of the reasons why it's not a fundamental change to the mar Toronto market versus other markets. Like uh, an example I like to use is, is Edmonton because I'm sort of intimately familiar with Edmonton because I used to invest there. Edmonton, fundamentals changed. The economic fundamentals that underpin that market fundamentally changed. The industry changed. Oil changed, uh, which meant no industry, no jobs people moving out of the city, people moving out of the province, um, huge exodus, people sold, prices dropped. And because people were moving out, there were, those people did not become renters in Edmonton, they, fund, they left Edmonton. Now let's, cha let's change the conversation. Let's talk about Toronto. 
if, if we get to the point where there's a sell off, you know, people sell or, you know, uh, whatever, can't pay their mortgages or wh whatever, right? There's a sell off, let's say, you know, prices, prices drop and everyone's scared and people still live in Toronto. They still like, you know, uh, there's an argument to be made. Yeah, they might uh, lose their job or whatever, but they'll still, people are still going to live in Toronto. People left Edmonton because there's, you don't stay in Edmonton or you don't stay in the oil patch unless you're working in the oil patch, oil fields, right? So people are still going to be in Toronto. And so in this kind of ironic twist of irony here, or twist of fate, you have a strengthening of the rental market. So that's actually what we've seen um, in, in previous years. So, you know, if we try to use the, the anecdotes of what happened in previous downturns, we saw, you know, when there's a sell off, there's prices drop, but then rents still fairly stable, right? We saw that through 2017. Um, prices went down a little bit, you know, uh, uh, in the areas that we, even we invest in, the, rent, the rental market was still strong. So again, um, we totally get the fact that this, this uh, coronavirus might, might be a little bit different, uh, but I would just want to share with you some of the um, experiences and anecdotes that we've had previously through other downturns. Cool. Oh, let's, uh, let's flip to the next slide. Um, sorry, the last thing I just wanted to add before we go to the next slide then. Okay. The last thing I just wanted to add was who's shaking in their boots right now? The people who are shaking in their boots right now are the people who invest on what I would call the fringes. Uh, people are investing in, uh, you know, cheap, cheaper type of places that attract a lower, low, lower socioeconomic profile tenant who, you know, serve attracting servers and, and people in those types of industries and the service-based jobs. Um, those people are shaking in their boots. There's an article that I, we didn't have time to put in here, but it was like the la this landlord was shaking in her boots because she's like, I, you know, I rent my places to people who don't have a lot of high, very high incomes in the service-based industry and they're losing their jobs and I don't know whether they can pay rent. Fundamentally, our business model is such that we're catering to a certain socioeconomic profile of tenant. Again, you know, just a quick overview. That person is a professional, millennial, three to five years out of school, making 60 to 80K, and that's actually pushing higher now. Um, university educated, uh, they make very good money. They're looking to probably maybe even buy their own place in a couple of years. They have financial reserves typically as well, or at least they have been a little more savvy with their finances and may be able to weather the storm. And Ming, what type of jobs do they have and where do they normally work? Uh, so you're talking about um, our target demographic? Yeah. Yeah, yeah I mean, we'll, we dive into this, I think, in the next slide. Oh, do we? But, Sorry. Yeah. Go ahead. yeah, go ahead then. But basically, you know, the, the people that we, we have always targeted that we, you know, that we've talked about ad nauseum are these young professionals. Um, you know, they're, they're people who are well-paid uh, the people who are well educated and they're knowledge workers, right? And that is, you know, th that's been very useful to us before. I don't think any of us, uh, you know, could have predicted something like uh, coronavirus sweeping through. But being a knowledge worker has protected that industry because they're not um, as bound to their physical presence uh, to be able to execute on their jobs, right? They're a, a large number of our tenants are able to work remotely. Uh, their lives have been impacted, but their ability to still be a product, like to be productive and do their jobs, has not. Um, the word that, that, that I, the word that I liked uh, that Ming used was something very, very specific. Our target demographic are knowledge workers, mm -hmm. right? They're knowledge workers. They're, that means they can work from anywhere. That means that you know, what's been hit hard right now are service and hospitality. Right. That's not to say it's going to be only isolated to that. Maybe it'll eventually ripple. But right now, um, these companies are allowing their, their young professionals, employees, to continue to work from home. And that's a, that's a huge deal right now. Right. 
it, even with social distancing, it allows them to still be gainfully employed, still let, let's kind of like business continue. Uh, definitely it's not gonna be business as usual, but these aren't people who are just gonna be, um, who, it, I'm not saying they're gonna be completely, you know, 100% insulated from this. There might be an effect, but that, that's, we're looking at this as a risk mitigation strategy. Nothing is risk-free. Right. All we're trying to do, our jobs as real estate investors are to try to mitigate risk. And we think that catering to this, this demographic of tenant profile has allowed us and will allow us to weather the storm a bit better than others. So let's dive into kind of the things that, you know, if you've been following us, the things that we've been, we've been talking about, this may be new to, to those who are new to, to our meetup. Uh, but there's a couple of things here. So We've always advocated making sure you have cash reserves. Um, so we, we use kind of a two month rule. So two months of rent in your, in your bank account. Uh, so that way you can weather at least a, a two month storm. Um, that's kind of first and foremost. So hopefully, you know, everybody here who's our clients, they've built up some cash reserves. Uh, secondly, the thing that we, we advocate a lot uh, is getting access to your credit when you can do it. Uh, you know, I, I have a lot of advisory sessions and one of the, the, the number one things that come out of my advisory sessions are um, getting access to your own equity. You never know what's going to happen in terms of how, how the, uh, you know, the lending market is. One day it could be easy to get access and the next day it could be very difficult. All you know is what's now. If you cannot get access to your own equity uh, in your, the properties that you have, do it now. If it becomes easier in four months, five months, fine, it's easier. Just go refi again. I'm sure Hugo is happy to help you out again. If it gets more difficult, it's highly unlikely that they come back and take away the credit that you already have access to. I'm not saying it's not possible, but it is, it is not very likely that they come back and shut down your line of credit or cut your line of credit in half. So get access while you can. You don't have to use it but get access to those HELOCs when you, when you can. Uh, and we're, we've always been pretty aggressive with our investors to tell them to, to get those HELOCs set up and to set up things like revolving lines of credit so that way their HELOCs automatically grow as the principal of their, um, their mortgage is paid down. That's kind of the first two things. Uh, next thing is variable rate mortgages. You know, another question that we get a lot is, you, should I should I invest? Sorry, should I get a fixed rate mortgage or should I get a variable rate mortgage? And we always say variable, right? Even if the fixed rates and those you know you've seen in you know months previous to this, fixed rates have been pretty attractive. But the reason that we advocate variable rate mortgages are interest rates are one of the big tools that the federal government can use to ease. Uh, to, to, to make life easier for those who have borrowed money. If you are a real estate investor, you're, you are by definition leveraged, right? You're using mortgages and other tools to invest. When shit hits the fan and the economy starts to take a downturn, we know that the federal government uses interest rates as a tool to stimulate the economy. They lower interest rates typically and therefore your mortgage goes down. So in times of economic stress, you are also getting a bit of relief from the government because your, your rate has come down a bit. So this is one of the reasons that we talk about getting a variable rate mortgage. Uh, and, next thing we have, sorry, oh, go ahead. Uh, and variable, we've always, we, we advocate variable because we always, um, as investors, we're constantly refinancing. And if you've gone fixed, then uh, that penalty can be pretty stiff. Um, so generally speaking, I'd say nine times out of 10, or maybe even more, um, we, we, we say variables kind of the, the way to go. And, um, the, just kind of coming back to the cash reserves. So we, you know, under normal circumstances, we normally say, okay, two months of rent in your bank account. Um, what I've also said, if you want to quote me in the past, I said, as you grow your portfolio, you're probably not going to need, you know, if you have 10 properties, probably not gonna need two months of rent for every property. Um, maybe you, it goes down to one month's, one month's rent uh, of it, you know, in the bank account as a reserve. I'm now saying with where we're at, 
maybe you need to insulate yourself a little more. Maybe that means throwing a little more into that bank account and replenishing that. Maybe that means to maybe three months of rent in each bank account. So again, these are just techniques and strategies and little tactics that we use to try to um, make sure that we can weather the storm and, and sleep at night. And then we'll come back to HELOC in a sec. I think we have that in, in playing defense, uh, but there's something there that I want to get to. Um, yeah, we, we go into that in more we detail. Do, we do, well. okay. Um, last thing is don't spend your cash flow. I've said this <laughs> so many times. Um, okay, so we all know in Toronto, cash flow is fairly tight anyway. So we always say, take that cash flow, you know, whatever it is, 500 bucks, 1,000 bucks, that's, you're, never gonna, you're not going to live off of that. That's not going to fundamentally change your life and your lifestyle. But that can help you weather some storms. And now this is a storm. This is a storm that's brewing. Let's all, um, like you shouldn't have been spending your cash flow. And if you're in the smaller, smaller markets with even higher cash flow, and you're, maybe you thought, oh, you know, I'm killing this cash flow. It's actually in the smaller towns. Anecdotally, um, if I, I've pulled, you know, volition clients who invested here in Toronto versus other people I know who have invested in, in smaller towns, smaller regions, it's the investors who are, who are invested in smaller towns and smaller regions catering to that socioeconomic profile tenant. They're the ones who are getting the calls from their tenants saying, hey, ew, April 1st, yeah, rent's going to be tough, right? We're not seeing that a lot. I'm not saying we're not, we're not seeing it at all, but we're not seeing it a lot in our Toronto um, rentals and with our Toronto tenant profile. Um, we are seeing it. I'm seeing it quite a lot, quite a bit more on an order of magnitude more um, for people who are, who have tenants who, you know, we're paying $800,000 in rent, $1,200 in rent um, versus like our clients, we're upward near 2,000, 2,500, 3,000. Um, those people don't seem to be panicking right now. We haven't received those calls saying, oh yeah, April 1st is going to be tough, right? So anyway, um, smaller towns, you guys have probably built up even more cash flow, and I hope you haven't spent it. <laughs> Okay. Go ahead. Nick. Where we get into, you know, we, we've already touched on this, but this is basically right tenant profiles in the right areas. Uh, we talked about how, you know, these are people that are basically able to work from home. So they're still able to be productive. Um, the other thing that, you know, we, we should touch on that here is in, in a downturn, when prices are affected and rents are affected, buying in the right areas mitigates that risk. We all know that the best properties in a down market are still the best properties, right? You may be able to get in on a better price, perhaps, but there's always demand for the best properties. For those of us who have been investing for, you know, it's almost 20 years for me. And for those who have been investing for a long time, know that, you know, a, a, a house that is a five minute walk from a subway station is always good. It doesn't matter if we're in a down market or an up market, the subway is not disappearing anytime soon and your house isn't moving any further away than that five minute uh, walk just because the economy isn't doing well. So you're, you're able to one, keep the rents uh, better if you do see a downturn in rents and you're able, the price of the house isn't affected as much as well. So you're, you're mitigated on both sides. Uh, and this is what, you know, this is one of the things that we're, you know, we, we advocate that people aren't as um, conscious, I'm not saying don't be conscious of the price you're paying, but price is one factor and it is, it's not the be all and end all. It is much more important to get a great property in a good area that can take a downturn than it is to try to save 20,000 to 30,000 bucks uh, to get something that's just in an okay area. We'll take this back to real estate theory. So um, there are multiple studies. There's a multitude of studies talking about uh, distance to transit and the importance of distance to transit because what they always talk about is when things are going well, there's a, an additional 15 to 20% lift in and around areas of transit. That's prices as well as rents. In a downturn, prices and rents are insulated by that same 15 to 20%. It's like the exact figure is like, I think 17 to 20%. And what that means is in a downturn, those, those areas near transit hubs don't fall as fast as the regular, the rest of the market. 
And that's the same for rents. And let's think about, let's think about why, at least from a rental perspective. Let's say, okay, I have, uh, let's say I have um, uh, some great units along the subway line. Those people still need to get to work, <laughs> right? Like there is always going to be demand for those. For those. Um, the other thing that we, that we always say is uh, if you can get two bedroom units, two bedroom units because when people in, in times of economic despair, people don't have as much to spend, let's just say whatever, you know, times are tough or lots of job or whatever, people tend to start bunking up. So two bedroom units become, start becoming a little more attractive. So if you can get two, unit, uh, two bedroom units um, that's available to you, then that's, go that's going to be the better bet than, than one bedroom units. Um, okay, anything else here? What else do we say? Uh, well, the last one is large diverse economies, high growing populations. Yeah. I think we've already kind of touched on that. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Okay. Cool. So now we're going to get into the defense plan. So that was the kind of stuff you should have been doing already. Uh, and hopefully a lot of you have been set up this way. You've been buying in the right areas, you're renting to the right tenants. Uh, but let's talk about like, we've already tried to mitigate the risk. Now we may, maybe need to take additional steps. So what, what are those? Uh, Russell Westcott calls us defense and offense when it comes to real estate investing. And as I mentioned, you know, championships are one on good defense. So let's, uh, let's go to the next slide, Matt. So defense plan, we got rent coming up April 1st, right? So there, are, you know, that's just a couple of days away. There are the three phases that we have set up here. Really the first phase is stuff that you should try to get done in the next couple of days. Uh, so next slide. Uh, so first thing is to investigate options with your bank. And this is for your mortgage payments. Now we're not talking about going and deferring your mortgages or your mortgage payments, but understand what options are available to you. This, this is something that everybody should, should be doing. Hopefully everybody already knows this, but a, a lot of mortgages offer things like skip a payment or some, some offer, you know, maybe a period that you can do an interest only payment. There are uh, levels of granularity before you get to the whole, I can't pay my mortgage at all. And you wanna understand what all those options are and what the impacts are if you take those options. This is no free lunch, right? Just because your uh, bank may offer you the ability to defer your mortgage payment doesn't mean they're not gonna tell Equifax and TransUnion, what you're up to. They're perf they're, it is well within their rights for them to be able to, uh, to do that. You don't want, uh, you know, that, you, you, don't, you might not want that information on your credit report. So just go call your bank or, you know, look at the emails that they've been sending, look through all those options, but import more importantly, understand what the impact is if you choose any of those options. And that may require a call to the bank. Um, next thing is freeze or defer tax payments. So we know that the, the federal government, uh, and you know, that some of the other levels of government have been offering deferrals of tax payments, uh, or deferrals of other bills or whatever those happen to be. These are easy things for us to compile together now and take action on that, right? You don't have to file your income taxes for an extra month. Great. That's another month that the money is in your pocket. Um, the next one that we have here is getting a HELOC. So if you haven't already set up a HELOC, if you haven't already set up a, you know, like a revolving line of credit, uh, this is an opportunity for you to do it. And this is something that you should be doing now while there's still liquidity in the, in the banking sector. Okay, let me just make sure. Um, Anything you want you, to add to that? Did you, the revolving line of credit, do you get into that later? I can't remember. Yeah, the revolving line credit is kind of in the in the next next one. You're talking okay. about with, you're talking about paying and then with withdrawing. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah okay. it's in the next one. Okay, so I'll just uh, we'll just keep on going then. Okay. And then the other big one is renewing relationships with your tenants. If you already haven't done this, and this is this is a big one, I think that uh, there, there's a whole group of people who are afraid to say anything to their tenants because they're worried that inciting the conversation is like just opening up the gravy train. 
And I'm not going to say that there isn't going to be a portion of people who may see things that way. But, you know, I think this is the time, you know, this is, this is a health issue. This is non-discriminatory. Everybody's involved. And if there is a time for us to all be empath empathetic and work together, this is it. Um, so I think now is the time to actually have that conversation with your tenants proactively. Hey, you know, be transparent with them. I don't have, uh, you know, uh, the ability to defer my mortgage payment. That's not an option for me. I want to understand what's happening on your side. How at risk do you think you are, right? Do you think you'll be able to make, uh, you know, the next couple of months of payments? Or how's your job, how, you know? Open up that conversation. You want to have that now uh, before, you don't, you don't want to assume, right? Uh, a lot of us have tenants who are, you know, well-paid, high-paying jobs, but maybe, you know, they are, they're an executive chef, right? High-paying job, but it's just not paying right now because that industry is stopped, right? Or you have somebody in, at WestJet or Air Canada who's an executive there. Their job could be at risk too. Do, do you know where your tenants work, right? They may be tied to one of these industries. So it's important to understand and have that conversation up front. And, and I think it's important to have that conversation too, because there's a lot of misinformation out there. Um, you, I mean, as you probably know, I can't remember what the number is, maybe Vinay or someone knows a bit better, but there's a whole bunch of people who are signing this petition, a whole bunch of renters who are signing this petition. Do you know how many, Vinay? You're on mute. Hey, uh, not sure right now, but it was like over, I think like 15, 16,000 people a couple days ago. Might be yeah. way higher now. Yeah, it was just, it was just like this, this absurd number of people, renters, who thought that um, they shouldn't pay rent because of something Doug Ford said, right? And, you know, uh, oh, the LTV is closed, so it means no evictions. So that means they, they, mean, they see that as, I don't need to pay rent. And then they see Doug Ford or... or Whoever talked, uh, I think the, the government talked to. Oh. Hi, Teo. <laughs> Teo, it's, it's, daddy, like, daddy it's like the BBC all over again. <laughs> um, okay, hold on. Then, uh, okay, hold on. So the last thing I was going to say, I have to take Teo after this. Uh, the last thing I was just going to say was um, a lot of these renters think that um, all these landlords are getting a, uh, mortgage deferrals. Uh, you know, it, you know, for the next six months, because that's what you keep on seeing in the, in the, uh, in the news. But the reality is much, much different. I, maybe um, Hugo will get into this, but, uh, but no, it's, it's actually, I don't know if any landlord is getting a... <laughs> yeah, I don't know anybody who's been able to get a deferral. I actually don't know if anybody wants to take it right now either, uh, because... We're, it's not clear, and, and maybe somebody on, on the line has gone through the process, what the impact is. You know, like, like I said, it's no free lunch. Banks are not just going to be, oh, you're, you're, you're all good, uh, and you're gonna, we're going to defer your mortgage with no consequence, right? Uh, I saw Boris just pop up say that he, he got a deferral. So maybe at the end, Boris, you can chime in, let us know uh, if what the, the conditions. Was... Well, I'd like to know, yeah. like, it, it, I'm wondering if, it, if it's like, okay, well, they think it's your primary residence, right? Or, but I mean, for, for a bunch of us, you know, if I've got 10 properties, you know, are they really going to say, okay, well, uh, yeah, okay, you defer all eight or 10 or 12 mortgages. It's, it's a tough sorry, conversation guys. to have. Uh, sorry. Hello? S did someone speak? Okay. So anyway, um, let, let's, let's keep going then because we've got a lot to get through. But uh, the next thing was, uh, you know, I was on another call and Barry McGuire, if you guys know who he is, he's an he's a, uh, investor who's also a lawyer. One of the things that he said is, you know, if you're relying on the rule of law to rule in your favor in a time of crisis, you're, you're, it's not going to work out. Uh, basically, in, in times of crisis, uh, judges are going to rule in the favor of tenants uh, almost universally across the board. And you have to show as a landlord that you've tried to do everything in your power. Um, so don't, don't count that, uh, you know, because your tenant's not paying you, 
because uh, their their circumstance could be worse, and the judge is going to be sympathetic towards them. Uh, they tend to be sympathetic towards them in times of crisis. So that was that was his uh, his legal opinion on this. So I wanted to you know share that with the group here because I think it's important to know that we we may think that you know things aren't favorable legally, but that doesn't necessarily mean the ruling's going to end up being in our favor. Okay, so medium phase two stuff. You want to go? Yeah. So the phase two stuff. This is you know actually doing things. I would say uh, the first one is m much more around preparation. The second phase would be like taking some action because maybe you need to. So the first thing is to actually now take action on some of the things you we found out in phase one. So maybe you go take those interest only payments. I know some people who have a large number of commercial properties have negotiated interest only payments with their bank for, uh, for a certain number of months. So that way they're, they're able to get through, you know, a tougher period. Uh, I know somebody who owns a medical building uh, and it's all like dentists and, you know, uh, optometrists and stuff like that. And those people, their business has just completely stopped. So that medical office building is just getting close to zero income right now. Um, so only the pharmacy is, is staying open in, in, in this medical building. So he's gone back, shown the impact, and negotiated an interest-only uh, mortgage payment uh, with the bank during that time. Um, you know, maybe you take advantage of that skip of payment to get you through one month or to add up, uh, to put aside a little bit of cash reserves, even if you are still getting rent that's coming in. So that skip a payment. So just as a, just a note, and maybe uh, maybe Hugo will get into this a bit later. Um, there might be I don't know if it's only certain banks or all the major banks, but there are at least uh, certain banks out there that do allow even forget coronavirus and correct, uh, forget um, the what the government announcement stuff. You know, for six months, a lot of banks offer every twelve months you're allowed to skip one payment. And, you know, Hugo can get into the, maybe the pros and cons of that. Um, and he could talk about whether that affects, you know, credit or anything else. But that's a lot, that, that option is built in to a lot of people's mortgages already. And then we're not talking about having to negotiate with them, show them hardship and all that stuff. It's just built into your mortgage as an option. Exactly. So, yeah, so that, that, that could be an option for you. It's not taking, you know, it's not doing six months, it's just doing one, and that one is not very difficult to, maybe not very difficult to execute on. Okay, next. The next thing here, I think, Matt, you wanted to dive into this. This is the concept of uh, using your revolving line of credit. Yeah, so basically, um, we should all be setting up lines of credits, or if you already have it set up, one way that we can um, utilize our line of credit effectively is if you just went and made your normal mortgage payment, and you had a revolving line of credit set up, every, for every dollar you pay down on that mortgage principal, it frees up a dollar on the line of credit. You could literally just turn around and borrow that line from that line of credit again, right? So let's say that I have a $5,000 mortgage payment. Let's just say 2,500 is interest, 2,500 is principal. And let's just say that I make the entire $5,000 um, mortgage payment, $2,500 frees up on my line of credit. And if I, so, desired, I could pull that back out. How you net out is effectively only making interest payments on the mortgage. So that could be a, an effective strategy for you. Um, it's not something I would necessarily recommend for the long term, but again, we're talking about tips and tricks and strategies and tactics to get us through weathering the storm. Right now it might be a tough time and it, it might be worth employing through these strategies, even though they might economically or financially in the long term may not be great, it's going to let you get to that long term. Whereas a lot of people are, uh, may not think of these things. And then maybe, you know, the, un the unthinkable happens and, you know, foreclosures and all this other stuff starts happening in our, uh, for them. Yeah, there's so, lots of, you know, less, these are, it's not always ideal, right? It's not like the defense plan is going to be that you're not going to take any hit. What we're trying to do is minimize or reduce the kind of hit you're taking before you get to the really like tough stuff, right? Yeah. Uh, so the next thing is refinance. So right now, we've owned our re rental properties for a certain number of years. Um, we paid down that mortgage principal. 
we could do a couple of things. We could re-amortize that mortgage back out to the maximum amortization, bringing down our monthly payments. That's one. The next thing we could do is take advantage of the low interest rate environment. So, I mean, if you guys are on this call, no doubt you know interest rates have dropped, right? Variable specifically. Um, and, you know, I'll leave it to Hugo to talk about what's happening on, on, the, on, the, on the fixed side. But interest rates are dropping and longer, uh, and if you re-amortize, you can bring those payments down and maybe, maybe it'll help you weather that storm as well. Uh, move your ten tenant to a cheaper unit. Oh, I, hey, yeah. this, this is the one that you were going to give a shout out to. Jason, yeah, so, you know, we on our Volition chat, um, we've been talking about what people have been doing. Uh, Jason, who's, who's a, a client of ours, uh, mentioned that this is something that he's done. He's had some tenants who are, are running into tough times, and what he was able to do is actually uh, take them out uh, of a, a higher paying unit that they're currently in and move them into... Uh, a unit that he has that has that's cheaper right a basement unit so that allowed them to you know weather their storm potentially longer and helped him rent out a unit that may be tougher in this market uh, so thanks Jason for sharing that with us yep. um, uh, yeah you, you could talk about this one yeah the next thing is a, a rent deferral plan and you know this is kind of the the uh, the I would say the most impactful out of kind of the phase two stuff, you know, we want, we have to, you know, our, our tenants still need to understand it's kind of human nature that they're only going to pay what to do. So we don't want to, you know, say, Hey, just don't stop paying us. But if they do, if they are running into problems where they're, they're unable to pay their rent, we want to figure out how we can work with them so they can still pay something. Right. So we want, you want to come up with a rent deferral plan and this is going to be different for everybody. Uh, depending on your individual situation. But the idea is, okay, you, you can pay 80% of your rent. Great. I'm going to take that 20% and I'll move it to rent due six months from now, eight months from now. Uh, know that that money is still due, but what you're doing is you're giving them a break now and you're taking that money and you're moving it to a later time. Make sure all of this is in writing. Of course, it goes without saying, you want to make sure all this is in writing and it's all very clear that this is not rent that you are waiving, but you rent deferral that you're doing in light of their current situation. Uh, and this go, goes back to what I said in phase one, where you want to have that relationship with your tenants where you can actually have these uh, positive conversations as to, you know, what their situation is like and how much is realistic for them to pay. Um, so yeah, get that down, understand what your numbers are, right? Because, you know, 80% of rent, you, you may be, maybe you've got a, you know, great property, 80%, you're, you're actually fine. You could potentially defer that a lot longer if you have a, if you have a good property. Maybe you can't. But understand when you're ha before you have that conversation with your tenant, how much can you move and how long can you move that money for? Yep. Cool. Uh, so expert mode. This is, this is the, the tougher stuff um, and the stuff that's definitely going to have more impact. Um, so we, we touched on this already, but this is actual deferral of your mortgage payments. So not paying the bank, having that, that, those payments move to, I guess, technically the end of your mortgage, but what is, what are the consequences there of doing that? Uh, I think, uh, there's been a chat going on in the background. So, you know, at the end we can catch up on what the impacts are for Boris. Um, but what that mortgage deferral would actually look like. This one was brought up by Danius uh, on our on our you know mastermind chat, and uh, thanks Danius for sharing this with us. This is uh, this is also a great idea. Danius's plan is if his tenants can't pay, they're going to the bank together to talk to the bank. I think this is this is great. This is really all of us trying to work together, both tenants and landlords, to figure out how to get around get you know get through the situation, and having your tenant with you at the bank, uh, you know, along with yourself, saying okay, this is. This is what we can do. This is where we're at. And working together as a team to work with the bank to figure out a solution yeah, is a much better approach than trying to be uh, a middleman or to be adversarial with either group. Uh, then the, yeah, it's, it's good because it actually, um, this can actually now firsthand demonstrate to the bank the, the idea of the financial hardship. Otherwise, it's just hearsay saying, oh, my tenant's not, not paying. Uh, but here you can actually demonstrate to them that, yeah, um, 
tenant XYZ, lost, uh, worked in the service industry, lost their jobs, they're not paying rent to me. <coughs> and, <coughs> and I'm hoping for a mortgage deferral. So it's, it's kind of, uh, it's, it's bringing together um, a more cohesive proposal rather than uh, just kind of asking. The, um, the next one is now we're getting into stuff that's um, you know, a little more involved. Pruning poor performing assets. And here I'm going to come back to real estate theory. So one book I told people um, to read, you know, for years, all you know, five years of meetups, I've, I've, I've touted this book. It's called Secrets of the Canadian Real Estate Cycle. Um, in my opinion, this is mandatory reading for a serious real estate investor. What this book talks about is how real estate is a cycle. Right. It, ta it talks about how real estate goes up, it goes down, and it talks about um, boom, bust, and recovery. And then, it's, and then it breaks it down into early boom and, and mid boom and late boom and early bust and mid bust and late bust and then early recovery and mid recovery and late recovery. It talks about how to identify where you are in the cycle and it talks about um, what the strategies you employ at each point in that real estate cycle. So where, from where we are right now, kind of heading into, you know, this, the, you know, the potential impacts of, of COVID, one of the things they talk about is using this as an opportunity to prune poor performing assets. We get, one thing we don't want to do as real estate investors is become emotionally attached to our real estate, right? We don't want to be like, oh, okay, you no, know, I, I think it'll keep on going up, or I really like that house, or it was my first one I ever bought, or anything like that, right? We want to be objective about this. If it's a poor performing asset, and by, by poor performing, I'm talking about can it sustain itself from a cash flow perspective? There's so many types of investments that fall into this category now. So let's say that you bought that single family home, single family bungalow in Willowdale, or you made a crap load of money in, you know, bought, you bought up in Markham or Stouffville or where, wherever, right? So prices have gone up. Okay, great. But is that still a good asset? At, at today's value, at 80% loans value, could it cash flow? And a lot of these places, I already know the answer. The answer is no. <laughs> in pretty much all these places, right? In Toronto. Um, a lot of people have made a lot of money on those and they, they, they're like, oh, damn, oh, I don't want to sell now because I might not get top dollar anymore. That's not the point. You're not trying to get top dollar right now. You're trying to play defense. You're trying to make sure that you can weather the storm. And in fact, pruning poor performing assets gives you the added advantage to play offense, which we're going to get to in a little while. So again, I just think about like, this is a great time to think about your portfolio, look to see what's underperforming, what, you know, you want to put your capital to highest, best use. This is a great opportunity to do so. So, you know, we see this a lot in condos as well. You know, you bought a condo at, 500,000 and now it's worth 650 and it doesn't cash flow like it hardly cash flowed when you bought it at 500 it definitely wouldn't cash flow if you refinance that 80 percent loan to value of 650 maybe this is the time to take that that built-in equity and now put it to a better about a better asset class yeah um and the other thing is deleveraging if you're uncomfortable again one reason you're going to have a tough time to cash flow is because the mortgage is the biggest component of your expenses, right? If you can lessen that impact somehow by, let's say you had a portfolio, let's say, you know, um, you could sell one of your assets, take the proceeds, put it against your other mortgages and bring down your overall loan to value, thereby bringing, your own, bringing down your overall debt servicing. You'll, you, you should be in a much more comfortable place. So the, it's not necessarily, I'm not talking about leveraging in terms of when people go, oh, you're over leveraged. You're over leveraged uh, means that you're, you know, you're subject to the swings of the market. I'm, that's not actually what I'm talking about. I'm talking about deleveraging in terms of trying to lessen the impacts of this cash flow crunch. Does that make sense? There's a difference. So I just want to make sure that that's clear. Uh, was that... Anything else you want to say here, Ming? 
Yeah, and there's just the last two points were around like if it comes down to pruning those performing assets, you know, there there's a lot of details in execution now, especially as you know where there's COVID concerns. You can't do open houses, uh, no showings. So, you know, things like three six uh, three sixty tours, dollhouse tours are more you know more important than ever before now to have your house move on the market and to have your property vacant. Um, you know. People aren't want to come, don't want to come in there, and tenants won't want people coming in there either. Uh, so there's an opportunity for that property to be vacant first before it goes in the market. It's really advantageous right now. So we have a lot of experience in this, right? You know, we consider ourselves um, uh, top-notch realtors. We are the top one percent of all realtors in Toronto, um, and we have extensive contacts with um, a lot of different people. Um, other like we have our our mailing list is very large. We have lots of investors. Uh, we're connected to other investor, um, uh, other investor realtors. Like we know how to move product uh, when it's hard to move that product. So um, you know, if it's a conversation you want to have, then reach out to someone on our team, and uh, we can we can help you there. Anything you want to add, Sam, <laughs> or Ed? No. All right. Let's move. Let's move on to the next slide. We're right. at uh, eight oh five. Okay. Okay. So offense. Um, you know, to to Matt's point earlier. Um, you know, so first of all, play defense. Right. Uh, don't go out trying to acquire another property if you're not in a situation that you could hold this for a while. You have to be okay if you buy an asset that sure maybe you're cash flowing, but the market may continue to go down. You don't know. None of us know. And if looking at the average sale price on MLS every couple of months and it continues to go down and you bought something and that's going to give you heartburn, go buy, right? That, that, that means you, you won't have the strength to make it through to the other side and you're going to panic sell and then you're going to be in even worse shape, right? So when it comes to offense, once you have good defense, then get into offense. Now is not the time to, to over leverage. And what we want to do is play for win-win. What I mean by that is there are people who are, will be looking to get out. There are, and unfortunately, in, in times like this, there's people who have not played good defense or not invested in the right things or, or have not taken advantage of the property itself to get the right kind of tenants, for example, and they're not in a good situation right now. So those people need, need out. Uh, they've, they've maybe tried to do the, the stuff we talked about phase one, phase two, and now they're into phase three. Um, so you can come in and try to make that purchase advantageous for them. Maybe they need a really long closing because they've got to uh, clear out the, I don't know, the, the tenants that are in there. Or maybe they need it really short so that way they have the money that can cover the, the debts that they owe. Uh, maybe they're looking for a really big, uh, you know, deposit check along with the offer because the last couple of deals have fallen through for them. You are in a position to be the ideal buyer, make it win-win for them, get the best asset. Notice I didn't say anything about getting the best price with this person. Now is the time. I, we've been investing in Toronto for a long time. Prices come up and down. But a good asset is always a good asset. And I will say this over and over again. A good asset is always a good asset. And now is not an opportunity in terms of pricing more than it is an opportunity in your ability to get to some of those best assets. Because traditionally in Toronto, when there's a good asset, everybody's after it. You know, 2030, we, we've had uh, bids in 2019 where we were seeing almost 50 offers on some of the best assets out there. That reality will change and has already changed. So now we are in, in a position where we can get into assets that are you know, close to public transit, that are cash flowing, that are getting the best tenant profiles, um, and we don't have to fight as much with other people. Um, you want to, is there anything else you want to add to that, Matt? Uh, no. Let's, okay, cool. Uh, let's, let's go on to the next thing. So as I said, we don't want to focus on the price, but we want to focus on that overall opportunity that we have in front of us. We can't time the bottom. Um, I don't know if, uh, you know, the, none of us have a crystal ball. And if any of us did, uh, you know, we, we'd, be, we'd be the richest people on, on this planet. But nobody, nobody really knows what's going to happen. Um, 
we may see prices get more attractive. We may not. Uh, I can tell you right now, pricing hasn't changed. Inventory has slightly changed. There's been some people pulling out of the market, but new listings has been surprisingly active. You know, the, the Volition team looks every day at what's coming on the market. And it is, it feels like a spring market. Every day there's new stuff coming on. Um, and we are seeing less offer dates. Uh, that has changed. Uh, but people are still trying to sell properties. So yes, focus on that best asset, focus in the best locations, focus on those tenants. Make sure that you're the, you know, the properties that you're investing are able to hold for the long term. So we're looking again for cash flowing properties, not massive cash flow, right? We've said many times, the difference between $500 cash flow, $800 cash flow is nothing but ego at the end of the day. $300 won't make a difference. I'd much rather get a $500 cash flowing property that's in the best neighborhood, that's got great tenant profiles and got tons of opportunity in it, than eke out another couple hundred bucks and not get the ideal tenant profile that I'm looking for. I'll lose that $300 very quickly in, you know, at the LTB or if they can't pay me because they've lost their jobs. Um, yeah, so I think, make sure I covered everything here. Yeah, Good. so I think the idea here is a lot of people are going to see the current circumstances as a threat. We choose to think about, about it as an opportunity, right? You can look at the same thing. It's either glass half full or half empty. Um, we don't, like, like when you said, we don't know what's going to happen, but what we do know and what is within our control is that we can now use this as an opportunity to secure better assets to hold for the long term, right? And so this means now you can find the best areas and not settle. Um, you know, if you're if you could buy an A class building, an A class neighborhood instead of settling, or better yet, um, not going up against competition. Um, now we're starting to see opportunities possibly to start putting conditions back, like that's unheard of. Right? We don't, in our market, when there's 20 offers, there's no conditions. Uh, but maybe that will start becoming an opportunity again as, uh, um, as things start progressing. So in the last like 10 or 15 years, uh, you know, Sam, you've, you've been very active as a uh, you know, real estate agent in the last 10, 15 years. Yeah. How many months have you been able to put conditions on offers? Like it's not been like, years it's like maybe like six to eight months in the last 10 years that you'd be able to put conditions on offers yeah probably that's it i don't even remember when was the last time i would be able to put a, any conditions on the offer <laughs> yeah. so this is the reality we may be seeing and you know people who are worried about you know uh, potentially financing or you know they want to do some massive renovations and we want to get some contractors through, or we want to have legal review of the contract and so, you know, power of sale. We may, we may be getting into a position where we can start to do conditions again on offers. We'll see. Yeah. yeah. And so, I mean, one thing we want to continue to stress is that um, price and the price that you actually acquire the asset for is actually a very small component of the overall success of that asset and of of investing i'm not saying it's 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 not important but you know what did you what were we talking about ming uh you know an extra if you if you're able to get it uh get it for an extra 20 or thirty thousand dollars cheaper um how little impact that actually had on the overall return over the long over the long term yeah, like we have our calculator online. If you don't sure. know, we have a, a, our website, volitionprop.com. There is an investment calculator on there. Don't take my word for it. Just do the math. If, you, if my price varies by ten, twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000, my overall return in five years, 10 years time is negligible. It doesn't make a damn difference. What, what really matters though is getting a good property. Like that's way, way more important. Uh, I, I think I saw a comment splash up on the screen uh, earlier about, you know, when Matt was talking about people shaking in their boots and those were people who closed last month. No, those people, if they've bought good properties and we've had a lot of clients who've been, who've been working with us every month, including this month, um, should they be shaking their boots? No. If they've bought in good locations, 
and their plan is to hold for the long term and the property has great potential, it's always going to be like that. Like I said, if you're five minutes from the subway, that subway's not disappearing because of coronavirus happening. That subway's not disappearing because we're in a market downturn. Um, that subway will always be there. We'll always be close to transit. We'll, we'll always be able to get uh, a good tenant profile as a result. So, you know, I don't believe that those people should be shaking their boots. Now they may, they may be <laughs> because <the laughs> it's is, is scary and it, it, it can, it, it can be nerve wracking. Uh, but I've been there. I, I purchased at the peak in 2017 and I watched my property value disintegrate twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 on top of me doing other stuff to make it uh, a little bit worse. Uh, that's a, a side discussion at some point in time, but, but you know, I'm now in 2020 and those property prices have more than recovered. I'm, I'm actually ahead. And it was only three years now. Coronavirus may be worse, but the, what, mattered was my ability to hold and get through the down and not have to sell my asset and have my hand forced while the market was down. Yep. Yep. Cool. I, I think that, uh, oh, we have one more slide on offense. Maybe we can we flip to the last one. Is this it or is there one more? There's one, I think one more after this. Oh yeah. Okay. You want to, you want to just dive into a bit on <laughs> <laughs> like this is like the expert of expert. <laughs> this is so this is what this is what Sam this is what Sam will be doing during this uh, during this coronavirus time. Uh, but basically, <laughs> this is what I hope to be doing. <laughs> this is what this is what Sam Ed, Ming and I will be doing during this downturn, right? Like this is because we know how real estate works. We understand the mechanisms through which you can build real estate. We also understand that real estate real estate is just cyclic. One of the things that um, one way to take advantage of this thought of in a, in a different way is, Hey, okay. Things are going to be tough for the next little while. We, we get that. Um, we don't know, like, like we said, there's two factors that we don't know here, how far it's going to drop and how long it's going to be. But we know over the long term it goes like this, right? We just need to weather that storm. And one way that we can take advantage of the fact that we're going through this storm is actually to do one of these, um, luxury triplex conversions. Because we know one of these luxury triplex conversions takes about 12 months. And again, I, I'm not saying, I'm not saying it's gonna be 12 months before this all blows over. What I am saying is during this time, uh, the, during this lull period or this down time or the times are gonna be tough, doesn't matter. <laughs> I'm gonna be using that time to do a mass, massive scale renovation anyway. Um, and cause I know where I'm going to eventually come out, I might come up the other side and the value might not be exactly where I want it quite, quite yet, but I'm okay with that because I used the worst possible time to my advantage, right? So this is, this is, this requires a different, a different mindset. Like this is not for the faint of heart. This is not for, okay, this is my first property. Uh, but this is for, you know, if you're able to. Um, change the mindset. If you're able to understand um, that this is cyclic and we just need to get through it, this strategy using a legal triplex conversion, using 12 months of renovations and, you know, uh, having to go through um, the, the COA and all the other stuff that comes along with trying to do a legal triplex, a legal luxury triplex conversion, you can use that to your advantage. And, so, and like yeah. we have many clients who, who have done this and who are doing this. The hardest part, the hardest part about doing the luxury triplex conversion is getting the damn place. It's like the <laughs> hardest thing is actually to get the asset that you can do this on. There's a lot of properties that this doesn't make sense on, but to be able to find the right property to, to do this, it, it's, it's not easy. Like we have clients that it takes months before we're able to secure the right asset, at the right price. So, you know, the, the, the big, you know, the, the kind of stuff that's underlying this that's not written out here in black and white is you're doing the luxury triplex conversion because you can do the luxury triplex conversion uh, potentially in this market. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, Sam will probably be using this opportunity to buy up the rest of the street that he owns uh, multiple properties on already. So, uh, yeah, there, there's a few of those streets in Toronto. I think you're going to start, <laughs> start, renaming, start <laughs> renaming those streets. Um, okay, cool. Are we, yeah, okay. I think that's the last thing. What do you want to do, Ming? Do you want to, we want to, yeah, go let's, to you know, I just want to be to mindful of time. Uh, so let's, let's flip over to Hugo. Let's, uh, Hugo, hopefully you're still on the line with us. 
and uh, you can, can talk about, you know, kind of what financing is like right now in our crazy pandemic time. Uh, and then right after that, we'll flip over to Vinay. Uh, Vinay is a, a client of ours who has a has a has an understanding of finance beyond just real estate. We're real estate guys at the end of the day, uh, but he has uh, some very interesting insights to share with us. And then we'll open it up for Q and A. Hugo, do you have slides, or do you want to do you want me to pass over the share the, the sharing of the screen to you, or do you, do you just want to? You know what? I um, can you hear me? Okay. Yep. Yep. Uh, cool. So um, I actually did start putting some slides together, but my world's been so chaotic in the last week or so that I just said, fuck it, I can't, I'm not going to bother because I have to keep changing them <laughs> every day. So I'm just going to go with the notes as of today, sort of fresh okay. off the press, okay. let you know what's happening. So I stopped it, the screen share. So you're, you're front and center now. Cool. Awesome. Um, so yeah, this is awesome, guys. Thanks again for inviting me. There's a massive turnout. I guess we have nowhere else to go. So uh, you <laughs> yeah. know, this, is, this is the reality of our new world. Um, you know, I won't really go into too much of a bio, but you know, really quickly, just for context, for anyone who hasn't met me. So I'm a mortgage agent, uh, my company uh, that, I, that I share with my two partners and about 50 agents across the country is Vine Group. And, uh, you know, we're one of the biggest teams in the country. We do tons of mortgage lending. We work with about 67 lenders, including some of the big banks, credit unions, private lenders, B lending, commercial, you know, basically everything under the sun. So I feel like I should probably share my personal view on what's happening with a bit of a, uh, I guess, you know, from the mortgage side of things, seeing a bit of a different angle than what you guys are seeing and what maybe most people are seeing. You know, we've obviously, we went into March as most of you may have seen with some pretty impressive uh, sales figures, especially in Toronto. Like it's just been a very interesting real estate market, very, very hot real estate market and definitely a, a seller's market. We were seeing a lot more applications in for new purchases as early as February than we were in the last few years. So definitely just as a trend, the market in Toronto has been very, very hot. If you took the whole Corona thing away, I think we would continue to see some really impressive numbers. And it's not that they're not there. I just think there's a little bit of a concern in general. And there's been a bit of a slower pause. But like you guys all mentioned, this is an opportunity to take advantage of that pause. Because again, if you took this whole Corona virus away, everybody on this chat would be in a crazy uh, bidding war trying to get whatever real estate you can. So there has been a bit of a slowdown, which is a great opportunity to, to take advantage of that. But going back to the mortgage stuff, so it's just been wild. It, I, I noticed some of the comments that some of you guys have been actively getting some mortgage applications in, looking at HELOCs, which, everyone, which you guys mentioned. You oh, if, everyone. So if, if anyone's been trying to do a mortgage, it's been a bit of a wild roller coaster ride in the last, just in the last week alone for a few reasons. And I'll kind of highlight them because a lot of you guys are just probably seeing the headlines in the newspaper. So uh, across the industry, most lenders have seen almost like an unprecedented amount of applications being submitted. Mainly in my opinion, because people are worried they want to get, they want to expedite any upcoming renewals, they want to expedite a refinance, they want just access to money. So the lenders have all been inundated with applications, which means that a typical turnaround time of maybe a few days for a response might take over a week. In some cases, two weeks I've seen some banks. So you have to appreciate that if you're going to be in defense mode and, 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 and reviewing your financial uh, situation and your mortgage lending, you want to give yourself a little bit of time because it is taking way longer than it has before because of the amount of applications, because people are working remotely. So it's, you know, can be a little bit less efficient if generally as a bank, you've been operating in a team environment where I can just turn my back and talk to my colleague about whatever file I'm working on. Now you're working remotely trying to figure it out. Less. So the whole thing is just slower. So I think going into a mortgage application now, expect to be patient and expect it to be a lot slower. So that's kind of the main thing you should be aware of. Uh, the other thing is a lot of the news has been highlighting uh, mortgage rates have dropped. You know, the Bank of Canada made an announcement or have a few announcements dropping rates, which is great, but that doesn't mean the rates are lower. If you actually go on any rate website uh, right now, you'll see that the rates are actually higher than they were, uh, you know, at the end of February before this whole thing sort of happened. And uh, it seems a little strange. Like, why would the Bank of Canada drop rates? We're obviously in a bit of a crisis mode. People are concerned about the economy. And generally, when you're in a very low growth mode, rates drop naturally to stimulate the economy, which is exactly what the government's trying to do is reduce rates, make access to credit a little easier. But at the same time, where it's unique is 
there's a lot of uncertainty in the market in terms of are these people going to default on their mortgages? Um, what is the reality of the employment market? We saw a million applications for EI, I think just in the last week, which is above, you know, last year at the same time, I think it was like 30,000 applications. So a massive amount of people are, are, are concerned about their jobs or losing their jobs or getting less income. So there's a bit of an uncertainty, a big cloud in, in, in the economy as to what's happening. So obviously the banks are concerned. And what does that mean is access to credit is going to go up temporarily. So if you're currently getting a mortgage right now, you're gonna see rates are almost, in some cases, 1% higher, about half a percent to 1% higher with big banks than they were before. And if I gave you an analogy as to why, because people are like, what the hell, I don't really understand that. So my analogy is this, when people found out about the coronavirus, they all rushed to buy toilet paper because they're like, I don't know why, but toilet paper was a hot commodity. And they all rushed to buy toilet paper and all of a sudden people are trying to resell toilet paper at a massive, premium because of how scarce it is. Sort of the same thing with money. If all of a sudden people are concerned about the possibility of not having access to capital, you know, banks are going to inflate rates temporarily and, and charge a risk premium to access that capital because they also don't know, you know, generally what's going to happen and they need to uh, build in ins their own insurance measures and cost measures to continue to operate at a profit. So you're, you are going to see rates currently a little bit higher. So what that means is anybody going through a mortgage application or if you bought a property and you're securing rates, I would almost 100% recommend going variable. Or if it's even an option, try to take as much as you can on the HELOC. We actually have some lenders in Ontario uh, that would give you the whole thing as a line of credit, which is unique because generally banks will not give you a HELOC on all your lending. You only get access to 65%. So if you have a million dollar home, 65% is HELOC, the rest of it has to be a mortgage. We have one lender that'll give you the whole thing as a HELOC, fully open, interest only, which means that you can now not only reduce your monthly payment obligations, which is great in a time of uncertainty, but also means that when this whole thing settles, you can now revisit the marketplace and go into maybe a fixed rate if that's what you like, or a variable rate at before coronavirus premium rate. So that, that's kind of my big takeaway on any of you guys that are currently looking at mortgages is try to stay short term, go with a variable rate or a HELOC option to try and allow you the opportunity to then renegotiate your pricing uh, before you go ahead into that. So we, we have, but we have seen a completely different world in the, market, uh, in the mortgage world and to add a little bit of fuel to the fire. On Friday, the system that almost all lenders use to access applications, submit applications, review files, this sort of thing, was uh had a security breach is what we're being told and it was down from friday to tuesday so anything anyone doing a mortgage application there was nothing happening for almost three days so again very unique world now on the plus side so i can take away all the negative now uh you know banking is deemed an essential service which means that a little bit of the uncertainty is sort of gone concerns around closing are temporarily gone because we know now that the land registry office, which registers closing of, of real estate, will remain open. So that means that we can continue to offer mortgage solutions and anyone looking for a mortgage can get access to that. So I think that should stimulate, sort, sort of cool the general market a little bit in that we can continue to offer mortgage lending. My advice, and you guys sort of kind of hinted on it, is, uh, you know, the big, big thing now is deferral payments. So I should probably talk on that. Um, so every single lender has offered deferral payment type programs, but it's not so clear cut in that, you know, it's not like you just call, you click okay, and you defer your payments for three to six months. You actually have to have a legitimate reason, and they're not going to grill you and ask you for a bunch of uh, information, but they are going to want to know, like, you know, it's been about two weeks. How has this affected you? Why do you need a deferral payment? You know, so you're going to have to have some sort of a legitimate reason, maybe a letter of employment or showing reduced pay hours, or maybe your tenants are, are sending you an email saying they're not going to pay you. There needs to be a real need. But I think rest assured that if you do, in fact, need some sort of deferral assistance, the banks will allow you to defer payments. Now, another question around, uh, will this affect my credit was mentioned. And at the end of the day, we're being told that if you're submitting the request through the appropriate channels, through your bank or your lender, and, um, and uh, it's been approved, then there shouldn't be any sort of uh, implications on your Equifax or TransUnion credit report, which would in the future affect your ability to get financing. So my feedback to everyone here is, unless you absolutely need to defer your mortgage payment, don't just take advantage of it for the sake of taking advantage of it. 
because you know I'm, I'm generally an optimist i don't think this is going to last too long you know i'm hoping in the next two months or so we're generally back to normal i, I hope anyways and you know if you can survive that then take advantage of that you know all the payment deferral is going to do is give you some short-term reprieve but if, again if you don't need it don't take advantage of it leave it alone forget it um, because in the event this continues to play out in a very bad way, you want the option to always go back and, and take advantage of that when you actually do need it. So I've had a lot of clients that automatically emailed this and said, I'm going to defer my payments because I can. Again, that's up to you. I would just personally recommend waiting it out and actually doing it when you need to. But inform yourself right now. Uh, on our website, uh, vinegroup.ca, I can put it in the window here in a second, we have a link, a coronavirus sort of news link, that has a list of all the lender contacts that would probably apply to everyone on this chat um, that you can call directly and inquire about the possibility of deferring your payments in the process just so like ming mentioned you're informed and you know your options so when you need to trigger it you can potentially go ahead and trigger it also inform yourself about your unsecured line of credit limits inform yourself about whatever HELOC option you have or potentially on how to get a HELOC. And obviously that's something that we more than happy to talk to you about. So those are some of the key things that I think are currently front and center with regards to mortgages. Hugo, um, I have a qu quick question. Sure. So, yeah. so you said, um, or the question specifically was, is it going to hit Equifax? Is it, are they going to know about it? But there was another question just talking about not necessarily Equifax and not necessarily your credit, but how this would be looked upon negatively by the lender or possibly be looked upon negatively by the lender thereby influencing negatively future financing future lending is that at all part of the conversation i mean we've been told and documented in writing that you know anyone who's requesting a payment deferral will not be penalized on their credit bureau i mean that's that's kind of the public communication that's, but at the same yeah, you know. that's, that's, that, that's on the bureau, but I'm wondering with like maybe, um, you know, that lender that goes, oh, hey, oh, hmm, you, you, you took advantage of this. Uh, uh, that means that we're not that comfortable lending to you again, sort of thing. I mean, at, at the end of the day, general lending is based on your credit history. And, you know, they are going to look at missed mortgage payments. But at the end of the day, it would, I, if I was a lender, you would not want to go on record saying to a client who opted for a payment deferral in a time of crisis and say to them, because of your, your 2020 Corona virus payment deferral, we're not giving you lending. If they, you know, they don't want to end up in the news because of that sort of item. And it's the same thing with people asking us about, well, my, my colleague was uh, let go from their job in the middle of a mortgage application. Oh, sorry, not let go. They were, their payments were cut or their hours were cut. Is that going to affect my mortgage application? And again, lenders don't want to be on the news saying we're declining mortgage applications because we just found out that your industry has been sort of let go. So there is a little bit of risk that the banks are taking on in the middle of this crisis. You know, the bank, uh, the, the government has reduced, um, reserve requirements for the bank. They've also uh, uh, provided liquidity to the market and have told the banks that they will back them up in the event of any default. So there is a bit of, there is a support system in place from the government channel all the way down to the banks. And in my personal opinion, what we're being told by the banks at a high level is that there won't be any repercussions for taking advantage of these payment deferrals. But, you know, if you guys already have a payment deferral option built into your mortgage, so I know, for example, BMO offers this, uh, TD has a vacation payment as well. If that's been negotiated into your original mortgage, you can already uh, request a skip a payment. As, again, as long as you're documenting it through the correct channel and you have the approval through the correct channel, I would keep that on file so that in the event this ever were to come up, you can show them proof that, hey, you know, I was told that I could do this. I have it in write, uh, writing, but I haven't been told by any lenders through our conversation that you would be penalized and this would be work would be used against you. I mean, again, this is in writing behind the scenes, what the banks think that's different, but we're being told that you will not be penalized for this, okay, uh, which, cool, is why, which is why I would recommend not actually taking advantage of it unless you need it. Because if this gets drawn out for six months, you know, and at that time you're in real need of it, you want to make sure that you haven't already taken advantage of it. So that's kind of my, my take on that. Um, what else did I want to comment on? that was worth mentioning. Now, I think as a defensive strategy, everyone here should look at revisiting their mortgage, their current mortgage, and, and see if there's any opportunities to do a few things. So number one is, can I access a HELOC 
which will give me an opportunity to be liquid in this time of sort of uncertainty and in this time of maybe no income from your tenants. So look at in, into what options are available in terms of accessing HELOC. Uh, number two is um, some of you may actually have some rates that are actually a little bit higher. And there are some very few lenders that are still offering decent rates. So it could be an opportunity to revisit your whole portfolio and actually look at refinancing, maybe transferring your higher rates to lower rates, especially because uh, of all these recent rate fluctuations, the penalties might actually be lower than you think. So maybe just inquiring on what your penalty looks like and unlocking some of that equity so that you can redeploy towards some of these opportunities. Because I do feel that the market is sort of, you know, a little bit slower than it has been in February. And there could be some great opportunities to pick some stuff up at lower lower levels. So that would be number two. Number three is the easiest thing you could do as well is if you're already making accelerated payments to your mortgage, ask your bank, can I just reduce my payment? So if you're paying, let's say $2,000 a month, and that's a bit of an aggressive payment, you might have the option to reduce your monthly payment without any impact on anything, uh, uh, just by going back to that original term. So if you took a 30 year amortization, that was supposed to be a $1,500 monthly payment, and you opted to do accelerated payment for 2000, you may be able to go back to that uh, original amount without any impact on anything. It's really just a quick request. If it's approved, it's automatically done. You don't really have to apply for it. So those are some of the basic things you can do now to take advantage of, um, you know, being liquid. You want to be as liquid as you can. You want to try and manage your cash flow because, you know, we don't know how this is all going to play out. Again, I, I, I'm optimist. I think that in the next two months or so, we should start to see a bit of a return to normal levels. Um, but um, that's, kind of, that's kind of what we're seeing. I think I touched on, actually there's two more things I want to touch on as well. Uh, what we're seeing, we work with three types of lenders. Uh, the A lenders, like a big bank, a credit union, this type of lenders. We work with B lenders, which are normally catered to people that don't normally fit that A bucket. So you know, your income is, is not really as high as it can be because you're self-employed and you write off everything or your credit's not too strong, or you have too many properties, or whatever reason you don't qualify at a big bank, a B lender is generally your next sort of option, and their rates are generally one to one and a half percent higher than a regular bank, but they give you a lot more options. We're seeing that with some of these B lenders, they are um, scaling down their loans a little bit in some markets, so we've been told by some banks that because of the possibility of a slowdown in the market, they're reducing their loan to values by 5% across most markets. So if previously they were going as high as 80% loan to value, they're reducing that maximum loan to 75% loan to value. What, so, what kind of markets? Uh, so urban markets like Toronto, we're going from 80 to 75. Anything outside of the GTA, which not, might, might not benefit too many people here, uh, smaller markets, they might be going from 75 to 70. So maybe a smaller market like a Barrie or a Hamilton or St. Catharines, or Windsor, you know, instead of going as high as 75, which is generally the cap before with B lenders, not A lenders, they might be going down a little bit more. So keep that in mind. Uh, you know, some banks, specifically B lenders, not the A lenders so much, but the B lenders are looking at reducing uh, their, those loan to values because of uncertainty around future, you know, values. So if you were dealing with a B lender, like a home trust, equitable bank, these type of lenders, they are going to be a little more conservative. Uh, the last type of lender is a private lender. So if you're doing a quick flip, you know, you got no income at all and you don't qualify with a regular bank, you're probably going to private lending. We are seeing a lot of private lenders concerned around liquidity and concerned that some of their investors are pulling money away from private mortgages and into the stock market, which is you know, some real value right now. And because of that lack uh, or concern around liquidity, we're seeing a lot of private lenders increasing their rates. So if you need to deal with some sort of a private lender right now, there is less lenders lending money. So there could be a, a slight premium uh, on private lending right now. In the GTA, I think you're a little bit safer. So for the audience here in Toronto, a lot more private lenders, but if you're fine, looking for a private mortgage outside of the GTA, we've been told some private lenders are not even lending at all right now. So just, just again, a little bit of insight on what we're seeing. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, I don't know if you guys have any questions. I'm more than happy to, you know, this is your forum, answer anything specific. That's just kind of what I've seen in the last three weeks that I think is worth commenting on. But anyone have any questions or do you guys have any questions that you, you want me to clarify at all? Yeah, so I think he's opening it up. You guys can feel free to unmute yourself and ask him directly. Or, or uh, use the chat. Oh, okay. Ming, yes. Ming prefers the, track, the chat. We have a hundred people on the line. Well, I think there's a way to raise your hand actually. <laughs> yes, yeah, so I got, um, let's see, I'm just trying to see if I can catch some of these. 
Uh, any thoughts on HELOC liquidity one month or two months from now? So I'm not really sure the question. Is it, um, yeah, I'm not really sure what the HELOC liquidity would mean one month or two months from now. Oh, I, I don't know if the question is access to HELOC. So we haven't been told. Uh, uh, Danius, uh, but I was just wondering, uh, so, you know, I've, I've got two HELOCs and I was just sort of wondering, so you know, I'm actually in the process of making them bigger. And so mm -hmm. say I want to withdraw cash from it. Like, would the bank ever say, you know, it's locked. You can't draw from it. Um, oh, I see what you're saying. Okay. I mean, the bank can do whatever they want, but, um, you know, we haven't been told or have had any indication or have had any declines for HELOCs right now. So I don't think that's the case, but um, you want to make sure you're using or you have actively been using your HELOC. Because what happens is people take on these massive HELOCs or don't even know they have a HELOC. They just have never used it. And it becomes sort of idle automatically in a 12 month period. If you don't touch it, it goes into idle mode. And if it goes into an idle mode, technically you can't access to, you can't have access to it until the bank reactivates it, which sometimes is a quick switch or sometimes requires a couple questions or even in some cases, a quick uh, credit search, a credit uh, check. So I would say for any of you guys that have a HELOC, make sure you're using it. I mean, it's like a credit card, you know, just borrow something from it and pay it back. Just keep it active because in a time like this if the banks chose to uh either for uh, limit your access to heloc or uh force you to convert that heloc into a mortgage which is be which would be more likely i don't think they would just say you can't access your heloc if you've been actively using it what they may say which we've seen about uh, almost 10 years ago was they were forcing people to convert the heloc into a mortgage so um you know again use your helocs even if it's just to activate it you know, transfer a thousand bucks back and forth just to keep it active. I've seen um, people suggest. Okay, so asking for a deferral, should we approach the bank? Oh, yeah, sorry. so we, we don't actually get involved Hugo. with the mortgage Hugo. deferrals. You have to Hugo. kind of go. I think right uh, Danius. You just have to connect with your bank directly. Most of the banks uh, have departments or people set up specifically for these conversations. You will find that the times to get a person on the phone will take longer. Oh, I don't know. I, I just heard a. Uh, Oh, I, I think Danny is still had a follow up. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Oh, that's, that's okay. Uh, it's, sorry, that was a long delay. Um, I guess I was just wondering. Um, you know, I've heard people say to kind of you know draw down, say you know like six months of kind of like operating expenses, just so you have it in some other bank um, in case something weird happens. Or is that just something that you know people are worrying a little too much about? Um, I mean, so are you saying that you should draw on a HELOC and have access to those funds for up to six months? Just yeah, kind of, kind of, it's kind of related to that question of them locking it down. But um, no, again, I haven't seen any 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 indication from any of the you know almost of the sixty seven lenders we work with. Maybe half of them do HELOCs. Nobody's hinted that HELOCs are no longer available. We're still sending them in, still getting them approved. No pushback on HELOCs. Still getting exceptions even so. I don't see that. I mean, obviously, if you're a pessimist or if you're super concerned, you know, the, the HELOCs are relatively cheap. I mean, HELOCs generally are prime plus one or prime plus half. We can do as little as prime. So you're looking at anywhere from 2.95 to 3.5% to borrow money. If you're concerned about that possibility, probably not a big deal to access three to six months of your operating uh, requirements, put it in a savings account, sit on it. You pay a little bit of interest on it, but if that helps you sleep at night, you know, sure. But I, I haven't seen any indication of any HELOCs being closed down, especially as the government just committed about fifty billion dollars of liquidity to the the banking sector. I think the banks, um, you know, have quite a bit of liquidity there, so I don't see that being an issue. And you know, uh, I think as uh, if things don't progressively get worse, I would imagine that would re remain. But you know, day to day, things to be things have been changing quite aggressively, so I, I think it doesn't hurt to do that. But I haven't seen any news of that at all, to be honest. Okay. Um, Oh, we've got two more questions, Hugo. Uh, I'll read them out to you and then let's, uh, let's continue on because we're already at uh, 8.45. Um, so Sean is asking, when asking for a deferral, should we approach the bank directly or go through a mortgage broker? So, I mean, it, it, again, you would probably want, it's going to be done by the bank directly. So you'd want to go directly to the bank. If you've dealt with a mortgage broker before, it probably doesn't hurt just to get their insights as to you know, depending on how it was structured and what kind of mortgage you got, they might be able to provide you some info before you even go to the bank. Uh, but if you actually want to go ahead and initiate it, it's going to be approved by the bank directly. So you have to call them. And, and again, on our website, vinegroup.ca, we do have a link to all the bank 
uh, phone numbers and you can call them. Just be more patient because they are all inundated with people calling, asking for the exact same thing. Uh, most banks are doing three to, up to six months of payment deferrals and that includes rental properties too. Okay. Um, uh, next question we had is uh, from Jane. I had a mortgage pre oh, hey, before COVID uh, for pre-construction. Now that the closing date might be further delayed, will it be asked to requalify? Well, so um, I guess regardless of COVID, uh, you know, if your pre-approval was good for three, four, five months, whatever the timeline was, anytime you have to push that uh, closing date out beyond the pre-approval timeline, you'll likely have to be pre-qualified every single time in a new credit bureau, new pay stuff, that sort of thing. So checking in regularly to make sure you continue to qualify is, uh, is really all you can do. I mean, most banks don't give you uh, more than three to four months of a pre-approval. And if you're dealing with a new construction, sometimes there's a bank or two banks linked with that project and they may be able to hold rates for you for up to a year and sometimes two years. So if you're concerned about losing your job or that sort of thing, you probably wanna reach out to the developer before you leave your job, ask them who the bank is on that project and try to secure a long-term rate hold, which generally doesn't require you to re-qualify. So that would be, you know, um, the thing. And it, will your rates change every time you re- qualify and re-extend your approval, it'll be based on current rates. The rates right now are not great anyway, so unless you're gonna close in the next month or two, probably not, you'll probably be in a better position, uh, you know, end of May to June and beyond, hopefully when, when all this sort of dust settles and where rates are back to historic lows like they were in February. Cool, um, so Ming, I know you wanna uh, move on. I have one quick question for you, Hugo, though. As uh, variable rates are dropping, um, most of us have, you know, regular um, variable mortgages, not adjustable rate mortgages where the payment actually changes. So the, 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 the ratio of principal to interest changes. You pay more principal, less interest, but you still pay the same amount of mortgage payment. Is, yeah. are, you, are you starting to see an opportunity to go back to the bank and go, hey, interest rates have dropped. Can we recalculate my, my, my mortgage payment? Yeah, that's, that's a good point. So it's good and bad. So we're seeing, we're seeing situations where if you're with a bank, for example, TD, for the most part, their mortgages will, will have flatline payments. So if the rates go up or down, your payments remain the same. It's great in an environment where variable rates are going up, like they've been in the last little while, where your payment remains the same. But now that they're going down, your payment also remains the same, which really is also good because your principal is being paid down faster. Now, depending on how you structured it and what type of mortgage it was set up as, you may be able to go back and ask them to re-amortize based on the current rates. Uh, in some cases, that could trigger a penalty though. So it just depends on the lender and how it was set up. Just asking them, hey, you know what? My variable rate is 1% lower in the last two weeks. My payment's the same. Can I, instead of opting for a deferral, can we simply just adjust that payment to reflect my current amortization? That might be a better way to go about it versus having to do a full out referral. Uh, deferral on you. Does that trigger a new, like, do you have to go through an application process for that or no. flip of the switch? It depends, but I would say generally it's, a, it's almost like a flip of the switch. You're just, the bank is essentially able to readjust your payment. You may have to just sign some sort of document saying your new payment is X. Normally doesn't require a credit bureau or anything like that for the most part of the banks. So yeah. cer certainly something worth asking, especially if you are already, uh, you know, uh, accelerating your payments or pay more than you had to would be another yeah. reason well it's just like a for most for a lot of people who have variable mortgages rates have basically dropped by a full percentage point and those and we'll you know, probably see even more i'll be my, my personal opinion is when the bank of canada gets together the first week of may for their scheduled uh rate meetings i think there there might be some a hint of another rate drop whether that's a quarter percent or half percent i don't know but there's certainly some value right now in going variable because you'll continue to benefit from that i mean we've seen some you know, you're like you said, 1% rate drop. That's a lot. That's, you know, we're seeing rates under 2% with um, some lenders. So it's, it's yeah. been pretty impressive. Cool. Uh, Ming, so I think you want to switch gears, right? Yeah, let's, uh, let's move over to Vinay. Uh, Vinay is one of our, uh, our, our beloved clients uh, with Volition and has, um, you know, insight, uh, as I mentioned before, beyond just real estate and talking about, you know, factors that are happening in the stock market around the world. So uh, I asked if you could uh, speak briefly uh, the whole, whole group about it. So Vinay, uh, do you have a presentation or? Uh, you... I'll share my screen in a few moments. Yeah. Uh, I'll just be showing like some uh, charts from 
Google Finance and a few others that I pulled down from the internet uh, just to make some points. Cool. Uh, so for those of you that don't know, my name's Vinay. I've been with Volition for it's been about a year now. Um, I basically got into investing, if you want to know about a bit of my background, right as 2008 started. So my introduction to investment was everything blowing up. And because of that, I've actually been waiting for another crash actually for quite a while. Uh, my fiance even says it creeps her out how excited I've been with everything blowing up and going to hell. And I don't mean that because I'm mocking, you know, anyone getting sick or the severity of the pandemic. Um, but I actually thought the market should have corrected quite a while ago and it hasn't. So to me, while I'm not happy that I'm losing money with my current investments, I am happier with the prices of things right now and buying them. Uh, so a brief history of why I came to Volition, uh, before these guys, um, pretty much was just about stocks, um, real estate. The reason I like real estate, I'm actually not a believer that real estate is a holy grail by any means. Uh, I just feel like the big advantages real estate has is number one, leverage, right? You put in $1, the bank puts in $4 and you get to keep all of the return on equity, right? They don't split the profits with you. You just pay them back the loan and interest. Two, you can mitigate a lot of the risk with real estate. You can't mitigate it all, but you can mitigate a lot of it if you buy smart, uh, you know, actually do work, put in the right tenants, don't cheap out in certain ways. And so I believe real estate can give you very good risk adjusted returns if done correctly, but it is a business. It's not like just buying a share of TD Bank TD Bank will never call you and say, oh, uh, there was a fire on the third floor in our branch in uh, Saskatchewan. Nobody cares. They're, you're a shareholder. You could be uh, in Belize on a beach and get a call that your triplex blew up, right? So real estate is a business when you're a property owner. If you want real estate without any work whatsoever, you either have to be super rich and own a million properties and have your own entire company with the CEO that gets paid six figures or just buy a REIT. Uh, so what I'm going to actually talk about is a little bit of the current market recession, the stock market, um, and then why I actually moved to Volition. Uh, I originally started all in condos, and the reason, the reason I moved to these guys was that condos are great, they're super easy, and honestly, you could have bought even a garbage fire in uh, 2014, and it would have tripled by now. Um, but as the market went higher and higher, the spread between what a unit rents for and what you're paying for it was getting bigger and bigger. And I didn't like just how much of uh, my portfolio or my family's portfolio was in assets that basically were barely cash flowing or not cash flowing. To me, that's great for maybe a few because you think the market's going to do really, really well. But once a lot of your portfolio is like that, you become very, very susceptible to any market crash, which is right now. If rents drop or your property is empty for two months, or anything like that, that's not good. Um, you'll hear Ming and Matt both say that cash flow isn't everything, but they don't throw cash flow away. Like it's not everything, but it sure as shit is something because it will help you sustain these downturns. All right. Like, you know, if you have a property that cash flows 7%, I, we're actually closing on one uh, with Edward. I thought the market downtown, where four weeks after meeting these guys, I ended up buying a full gut triplex right? Like buying it, still in the process of fully gutting it. Um, we bought another one that's closing in May. This one, not the same type. I thought the market was too high. This one's more, less appreciation, more cash flow. On this property, once we close, I can drop the rents by 35% and still break even. Um, so this is actually why I like Volition. For every property I've bought, I've probably sent Edward 500 properties a month saying, hey, what about this one? What about this one? And he actually stops me from buying. He is one of the few agents that's telling me, no, stop. Other <laughs> agents, trust me, you will not get that very often from an agent not making you buy something because for them, that's, they make their easiest money right there, right? Um, so about this current crash, there has been a lot of financial crises in you know, the last hundred years. Every single time people think it's the end of the world, it never has been so far. Um, a common saying of investors or Warren Buffett is, oh, every time there's a crash, they say it's different. It never is. Uh, that's true and not true. The cause of the crash is normally different. What companies will survive is a little different, right? Like in 2001 or 2000, sorry, if you had bought uh, some random online grocery store that opened up 
uh, it probably went bankrupt, right? You lost all your money. Um, so not everything will survive. But overall, the market has always recovered. It's just how fast do you think the market will recover should change your investment decisions and how good you are to weather the storm. I mean, you could be somebody who has, you know, say a 60,000 a year job, but you're at the federal government and you only live off of 30,000 a year. You're probably really well prepared to weather this. Your job is probably really safe and you have a very low burn rate. You could be someone earning 300,000 a year. And even if your job is safe, maybe some of that's bonus or commission and that drops significantly, or even if that drops to 200,000, your burn rate might be very high. I have uh, a buddy of mine from Western, he went to private school and so did his two siblings. That private school is $40,000 a year. So there was some years where his parents were spending $120,000 of after-tax money just for their kids to go to high school. So if you're in that scenario, even if you earn a ton of money, you better hope that this recession picks right back up within a year because you can't afford your own lifestyle. So I'm going to share my screen right now and show you kind of historically a lot of different crashes and you'll kind of see what I'm talking about. All right, let's see here. All right, uh, share computer. Okay, let me know when you guys can see my screen. Yep. Okay, so this chart full of squiggles here is basically how the S&P, it's one way to measure the market. It's Standard & Poor's 500. It's uh, 500 different companies that kind of make up a big spread of the US economy. So this one right here is our current crash. No, in no other crash have we ever fallen below a 25% within 20 days. If you notice any other crash to hit 25%, it took at least 40 days. Now this is, uh, as of a little while ago, this is not up to date as of today. But the reason I believe for this instant crash that's so fast is that normally in a financial crisis, you have some issue like uh, banks start losing liquidity, there's oil plunges, there's a war, there's all these different things. What's happened is this virus has basically come, waved a magic wand and shut down all these jobs instantly, right? We've never had this many unemployment insurance claims in one month. This virus, what it's done to the economy is basically gone directly to job losses, which is why people are, you know, it's dumping so fast. The other thing you have to realize is this is kind of a prolonged look at uh, how long and how far some of these crashes can fall. So this blue line right here, if you look, is 1929. This is known as the Great Depression. So World War I finished in 1918, and the, there was a roaring 20s where everyone thought the economy was magic, nothing could go wrong. Then the market blew up. Uh, but keep in mind, after this, you know, this just kind of shows the peak of the bottom. This didn't just shoot up again. Uh, this stayed flat for quite a while, but you also had something called World War II and a few other fun times that uh, kept the market low for a while. This right here, if you look at the orange one, this shows that, okay, things fell, they went up, they went down. Like you could look like, oh, at one point the market went way down, looked like it came back up and went down again. This orange one is the uh, 1973, I believe this was the oil crisis. At this, when this crisis happened, uh, a lot of countries stopped selling oil to North America. You actually could go to the gas station and not have any gas. They would have signs saying no gas, right? So different cause, but uh, same thing. Recession happened, 1987. This is known as the Asian financial crisis. Uh, you had a lot of what were known as the uh, Asian tigers, such as South Korea, uh, Japan, uh, and a few others in that area, uh, all of a sudden experience a huge crash in their market value. Uh, some of them started to blame George Soros and say that he was currency manipulating, but this dragged the economy down for a while as well, right? Uh, one thing you have to notice is with all of these, there's ups and downs. So even if, you know, you see a crazy upswing, that doesn't just mean that this is over, right? Uh, the blue one here, this was in 2000, dot-com crash, 2007. Uh, a lot of you obviously know this one. This was the most recent depression. And if you notice, this actually went a severe percentage drop as the Great Depression, which is why this was considered such a big deal. Uh, a lot of you don't even remember, but we actually had a crash in 2018. 
uh, between September and December 2018, the market dropped 30%, pretty much. Um, it shows 20 here, but this is, you know, there's a lot of different ways to measure the market. I'll show you another one shortly. Uh, and this is, you know, our current one. So when you look at these, all of these, you know, this one recovered the fastest within three months. We were back. Who knows? Maybe that'll be what happens now. A lot of these sittings fell for over a year or two years. And then once they fell, it depends on how long they stayed down. So there's not just buying the bottom. It's how long will the market stay down? So if you have, for instance, in 2008, the market fell for about a year. This green line here went really low. But then by 2010, 2011, it had pretty much recovered. Not too many people think 2012 was a bad year. In 1929, the market stayed low for half a decade. So if you had a company, like if you bought, say, I'll show you guys some examples in a second, but here's, for instance, a better example of just the Dow 30. This is the 30 biggest companies in America. So just the 2018 crash and the Great Depression, right? They both were severe drops. The difference that's not shown on this is that this basically marked the start of recovery for uh, the Great Depression, it stayed low, hence why it's called the Great Depression. This bar right here is the little rally we've had in the last two days. So it seems like, oh my god, if I bought here, I've made like 20% of my money, yeah, that could be gone too. I mean, like, look what happened right here. So all these ups and downs are very typical of a recession. So this is kind of the market since the beginning of the 80s. If you look just here on Google Finance, you can see markets go up, they go down. But over the long term, they go up. But if you look closely, 2007, all the way down here when the market bottomed out, then it was pretty much back by 2012, 2011. We have not had a pretty hard drop, apart from this one right here that lasted three months for quite a while. Recessions happen between seven, every six to nine years. It's been about, you know, 12 since we've had our last one. If you look closely here, where is a good chart, actually? This is a perfect one. Okay, so this is 1929. This crashed way down and then took over a decade to come back. But during this time, what's different now is we're hopefully not going to have World War II and we don't have our money on the gold standard. So now, since we don't have our money linked to the price of gold anymore, we can print money, which is bad because it can lead to hyperinflation, but it's good because when there's an artificial liquidity crisis, you can kind of print your way out of it. If you now scroll over to, all right, let's look at, where's another one? Yeah, in the 70s, the oil crisis, when basically a lot of Arab nations stopped selling North America and Europe oil, tanks the economy. Not because oil prices were low, because there was no oil. You couldn't get it, right? 1987, and all these crises look huge until you compare them to the next one. 97, huge dump. Uh, Asian financial crisis, came back within two years. All right, here is now, uh, whoops, our current one. Makes all the others look super tiny. But our current one, if you notice here in September, we dropped proportionally 30%, but came back in three months because there was no actual job losses or anything. The market just took a dive. Some people argue it was because the government said they were going to stop quantitative easing. But there was no job losses. Do any of you even remember a financial crisis in 2018? There wasn't one, but the stock market did drop 30%. And then it just skyrocketed again. And now it looks like there could actually be one because there's actual job losses. So if you want to look at, for instance, uh, this is Apple. You all know this company. If you had bought Apple one year ago, you've still made a lot of money, right? Apple isn't even below where it was a year ago. And if you look back in, uh, where do we go here, five years? So if I go to a five-year chart right here in 2018, all the way down, it lost 30% of its value. Most people don't remember, oh my God, the market's crashing like crazy because it came right back. Now here we might have like a longer issue. Uh, to me, Apple, normally I would be a little worried if we're in a long recession over a uh, very luxury good, but Apple also has 200 billion in cash. Um, please do not take any of my advice though as direct financial investments. Please assume I'm trying to steal your money. I am a thief and know nothing. I am not certified in any way and I'm not responsible for any of your decisions. 
so I'm just showing you kind of different stocks. So if you say think the market is going to rebound like crazy, this is just super, super minimum. Everyone's going to get it over it in like a month. Well, then you might want to stock kind of like, uh, hold on. I'm going to move this video thing out of the way. Uh, here, the Las Vegas Sands Corp. So if you, if you look at uh, TD Bank, for instance, in 2008, it basically dropped at the bottom by 50%. So if you bought 100 bucks of it at the bottom, within two years, you would have had $200, right? So that's cool. TD Bank, people were afraid, but they're like, all right, if something's going to survive, TD Bank is a pretty good shot. It's one of the big five banks in Canada. Government probably won't let it fail. And, you know, you would have doubled your money. If you had bought the Las Vegas Sands Corp, this stock fell all the way down to $2, the reason for that is there's a bunch, you know, the guy was investigated for bribery that owns it. They had just spent a huge amount of money for casinos over land. And people thought if, you know, there's a long-term financial crisis, people aren't going to be gambling. If you had bought a hundred dollars at the bottom of this, you would have like, you know, 10 X your money instantly, actually more, you would have 25 X your money within two years. Right? So there's a risk versus reward. And this only worked because the market recovered overall. If the market had stayed low for two, three years, this company might have gone bankrupt. So there is a big risk versus reward when you're looking at the stock market, what's going to come back, why sometimes things change. Uh, if you want to see another company, Canada Utilities, right? Utility company in Ontario. Very unlikely that it's going to go bankrupt because, you know, you still need power. Pays a nice dividend it hasn't fallen that much. Like here's $36, here it is. Okay, that's not great. But if you bought it a couple years ago, you know, at some peaks, it's not the worst and it's very secure. So what you, when you look at the market, you have to decide, okay, is the market going to recover instantly? Like in six months, if this is all gonna be gone, people are gonna be back to buying everything. Well. If that's your bet, you could maybe put a bit more money into risky things. If you think, nope, this is going to screw up the market for years, well, maybe you don't want to buy into companies that don't make a lot of money. If it's a growth company that barely makes any money, that company might not be able to last three years of low sales when they go to refinance their debt, right? Like you can look at some companies like Microsoft. If you had bought it at the peak, it took over a decade before it started ramping up again, right? Because that basically in 2000, people thought Microsoft was going to make our world like any sci-fi movie or Tron. So it was absurdly valued uh, at the time. It was by far the biggest company in the world. And it took literally more than a decade for it to get back to that price. So what I'm trying to show people is there is no like guarantee of what's going to happen to the market. It could recover in, you know, six months, right? Or it could recover in two years. It could take five years. Anybody that says they know for sure is lying to you. Um, things that are different compared to previous recessions, we aren't on the gold standard. We have governments that are very okay with printing unlimited money. Um, and, you know, we're cutting interest rates to zero, maybe even negative. Uh, the last 10 years have had almost, you know, you can attest to this, pretty much under 3% interest rates for almost the whole time, right? So I don't want to say that, oh, I know what's going to happen because I don't. I don't want to say, oh, you should buy this stock or that stock because I don't know what's better. But I do want to tell you that, yes, generally we recover from recessions. It's just your risk tolerance and what you believe is going to happen that should determine how you put your money. And this is the stock market. It's the same thing for real estate. If you think in one year, oh, Toronto's gonna be back and flying high. Well, maybe you wanna buy a condo that doesn't cash flow, say the area that a thousand bucks a square foot, uh, you buy something at $800 a square foot, doesn't cash flow, but you're like, oh, in a year, that'll be back up to a thousand, I'm gonna make a quick flip. Well, that's fine if you believe that's what's gonna happen and you can hold the risk and you won't lose all your money. But if say the market stays low for two years, well, then all of a sudden you've put a ton of money into a condo that stayed at that price, isn't paying you, and you're actually paying into it. So maybe in that case, you should have bought something that cash flowed a lot better. Uh, nobody knows what will happen. You have to assess your own risk tolerance and finances. Um, there's actually a very good 
uh, thing that this is what Wealthsimple put out. The market crashed, should I buy the dip? They actually lay out step by step, what should you do? You should get rid of your debts. You should build up an emergency fund. Um, you should also look at how close you are to retirement. Even if you think the market is going to recover in a year and you're going to buy only risky things, can you afford to be wrong, right? If you're wrong and the market doesn't recover and you put all your money into super risky stuff that goes kaput, you're retiring. You don't have time to make that back. If you're young, I mean, I would hate to lose all my money right now. But if I did, I have over 30 years of working to earn that back. So maybe for me, what's correct isn't what's right for you. Uh, what I do want everyone to realize, though, is that we do get out of horrible recessions. It does happen. It doesn't end the world. It doesn't blow up the money system. It doesn't mean Bitcoin replaces the U.S. dollar. I don't know what the winners and losers are going to be. I was showing the example of TD Bank, but maybe you think, oh, no, they have too many uh, loans out to shale oil gas companies in the States. That's terrible. Uh, oil's going to stay low for a long time. It's going to affect TD. Maybe you think that uh, CIBC, even though they've been considered a bad performing bank, because they had a hardcore mortgage audit four years ago, they're a lot stricter, so they have better loans. So when Canadian real estate blows up, they'll be a better bet. I am not here to tell you what stock to buy. I'm just telling you that whenever anyone gives you a hot stock tip or a hot real estate tip, please kind of consider what your situation is and what's appropriate for you, right? I mean, Wellsimple laid out a great amount here. They even said, all right, if you want to gamble with some money, it's okay if you don't see it again, take some risk. Buy some random stocks, even though you should probably buy an ETF. If you want to retire right away, pretty much go all bonds, right, with a little bit of stock. They also lay out really about getting your finances in order. Do not borrow money off your credit card to invest right now. That is the last thing you should be doing. The biggest problem right now is we don't know what's going to happen. We have never seen instantly a million people in Canada go on unemployment insurance. Not even close, right? We have never seen a magic wand being waved and jobs just gone like that. That doesn't mean we're not going to recover from it, but what that recovery looks like, nobody can tell you. Anyone that says they can is a liar, right? Maybe they get lucky and they're correct, but they are probably a liar. So to me, what I want to explain to you guys is, hold on, how do I stop sharing this? I don't need this anymore. Uh, oh, here we go. What I want to make sure you guys understand is don't yank out all your money and try to hot flip the market. 90% of people lose their money doing that. When I started investing, I had the worst thing happen to me. I got very successful. And at the age of 18, that made me think I knew better than Warren Buffett and was going to flip stocks and retire off of this. It doesn't last. If you truly believe that with no experience, you're going to beat out uh, multi-billion dollar hedge funds day trading, good luck. Uh, I would just recommend you don't bank all your money. If you noticed, uh, in the real estate community, there was quite a few guys that pitched seminars on selling put options. And their whole... Uh, how do I say this? Their whole pitch was stocks on average go up. So sell put options because even if, you know, the market goes down a little bit, you'll end up just buying the stocks of good companies anyway. That's great when for the last 10 years, the market was on a tear. Any of people who sold puts that were expiring anytime in March or the future, oh my goodness, the amount of money you could have lost because when I took a quick look through their strategy, it was not complete. It was not uh, safe. They didn't show you how to hedge your positions with calls and offsets. Please do not just get into any get-rich-quick scheme. That is where you will start losing all your money. Don't sign up for multi-level marketing. Do not sign up for anyone that says, oh, I know how to play the recession. I'm a genius. Um, I'm sure a lot of you have seen that movie, uh, The Big Short, right? Uh, where they talk about the financial crisis. Christian Bale's character, he was right about the financial crisis. He almost went broke before his bets paid off. And that guy had billions behind him. He almost ran out of money betting against the market before the market finally tanked. Uh, John Paulson, a guy that made $4 billion during the crisis, the next year, everyone thought he was a genius. 
people put money with him, he lost 30% of his investors' money because he read the market wrong. All I'm trying to say is nobody knows, and that's okay as long as you have a long-term perspective and don't buy things or sell things simply out of fear and emotion. You have to be honest with yourself. And if you are, now can be a great time if you're starting to make money and invest. Normally, people would jump to buy real estate or stocks at these prices, but you have to be aware that it could still go lower and you have to not panic sell and then not buy again for three years. All right, so the spiel was a little bit of a rant instead of clear cut information. But what I'm trying to explain is the world will get better, but no one can tell you if it's going to be in six months or three years. So based on that, you then have to decide, all right, do I want to go with uh, a property volition recommends that is a full gut triplex. I might not be able to refi my money out and you know, the rental market might be so, so you could, but you better be someone like Matt or Sam that has done this, that can run the renovations that have the reserves to hold through. If you can't do that, you can still buy property, but I would potentially, you know, wait until all these stimulus packages run out. Once the virus is over, even if 10,000 people got laid off, not all 10,000 are going to get hired back. Uh, for me personally, I would, for the stock market, slowly buy, uh, maybe in chunks over the next 12 to 18 months. So let's say you had 1.2 million, maybe every month you put in 100,000. You might not buy all the bottom, but you will definitely get some good deals. If you are looking at real estate, don't dump every single penny into the first good deal you see. Uh, like Sam said earlier, he can't even remember the last time he was able to put conditions in on an offer. You can start doing that now. Uh, you might be able to get better deals a little later. Get your finances in order and make sure your job is secure. Because if you decide, oh, this is the time to make my millions, and three months later when the economy is bad, you get laid off, you are going to be in for a hurt. Uh, so I hope that kind of gives you guys a little bit of a picture of why this crash is so severe. Uh, it's mainly due to instant job losses. It's not, you know, anything we haven't seen before. Um, you just have to know how to prepare properly. And especially with your real estate holdings, because of leverage, um, you should be talking with people like Matt, Ming, Edward, Sam, uh, that know how to properly guide you through a crash. Don't just buy the first hot assignment deal you see simply because it's below market value. Market value is different. What you're, The neighborhood that's $1,000 a square foot might not be $1,000 a square foot three months from now. So just be aware of that. Be careful of you know anyone that says, ah, this is the worst, that's the best. I you know, rang, uh, I often call out Grant Cardone in the Volition group chat as somebody who I believe is basically a charlatan con man. <laughs> uh, he, yeah, I, like, I know some of you guys have even presented with him. I like some of his ideas. The concept of 10xing, be able to scale your business, very good. His whole hating on the stock market is dumb. He likes to not admit, but he often says multifamily or huge multifamily is the only way to go. So you have to invest with him. He made a huge chunk of his money through a single family home. And it's, on, weirdly enough, almost the same amount of money that he made off that home that was used to start the whole Cardone Capital. So don't, just be aware of a lot of these people who pitch their story or that their only method or this or that. The, the truth is often a lot different. So that's kind of my rant on the stock market, what stocks are looking like. And if you choose to invest in them, please do your own research. Don't just trust some random person on a Zoom meeting that you have never met in person or have never, you know, talk to. For all you know, I could be a con man and I'm out there selling puts and trying to get all your money. All right. Um, well, we, we definitely appreciate uh, your insight, Vinay. I think that, you know, what we try to do with, um, you know, with our community here is, you know, myself, Sam, Matt, Ed, we have real estate expertise. There's areas, but we know that anybody who's interested in real estate investing, they're interested in wealth building in general. Uh, so I really appreciate, you know, Vinay, you coming in and giving us a bit of an update on the stock market, areas that, you know, we, we are not experts in. So, so thank you very much for that.
Okay. Yeah, yeah, I really appreciate it. <laughs> it's a it's a great perspective, and and a lot of what you say, a lot of what you're talking about in the stock market, it's directly applicable to real estate. If you don't have to just be a real estate guy or a stock guy, it, you know the same principles apply um, in both places. So. Uh, thanks for the shout outs. Appreciate it a lot. Uh, Ed, Ed, Ed's showing his face now. He was on, uh, uh, he was on, his video was off for a while, but uh, looks like he just came back from the gym. It's all like. Uh, I, was, I was having dinner. I, was, wow. I just made dinner. So I didn't, I didn't want to, I, I didn't want to show my face. He was oh. doing those, those spoon curls. <laughs> uh, Matt, you want to go back and share, uh, share the slides? Oh, okay. Yeah, sure. Actually, you know what? I have a quick question from Vinay, um, if, yeah. if you don't mind. Just because, uh, you know, as much as I like real estate, I, I, I am slightly investing in stocks too. So what do you think about the stimulus package that, that just came, uh, that just got announced? It's like $2 trillion being pumped into the U.S. market. Um, it's quite significant, right? They're willing to start giving in individuals checks. So even if there's unemployment, there's still, still going to be money circulating in the market. It's, it seems like it's, uh, it's a step towards the right direction. Obviously, it's going to cause some sort of inflation, um, long-term, I'm guessing. But what are your thoughts overall? So generally, when a country just prints $2 trillion, that's a bad thing. Uh, yeah. What's happening in the U.S. is the U.S. dollar is looked at as a safe haven. So even though they're printing more, they're not like Zimbabwe, where you know they have trillion-dollar bills. A lot of countries and people are trying to buy U.S. dollars. I mean, if you look at our Canada to U.S. exchange rate, so that's actually going to help keep inflation down. I'm actually a big fan of giving money to people directly as opposed yeah. to the whole, you know, Reaganomics trickle down, just give tax breaks to the rich and the corporations, and then they'll, you know, because they're so nice, just pay their employees more. We've right. shown that that doesn't work. And I doesn't actually believe sense. that's one of the reasons that a lot of these financial crises has happened. Uh, mm -hmm. The actual people who consume and buy things in the economy don't get a proportional share of the earnings. So then mm -hmm. they take on more debt and it blows things up eventually. With right. the stimulus package, it's good. But what people don't realize is we've had nearly free money for 10 years. So mm -hmm. a lot of companies like uh, Boeing's a great example. Their stocks tanked. People are really mad. They had all those crashes. Uh, they spent billions and billions of dollars buy back, right? on, yeah, on buying back their shares um, be simply because, or Apple, they've been doing stock buybacks and borrowing money to do it, even though they have 200 billion in cash, because borrowing money was so cheap that a lot of these companies didn't even have a place to spend it. They were just using it on stock buybacks to, you know, slowly push up the price of their shares. And for those of you that don't know, stock buybacks used to be illegal, I think until like 1987, because it was considered market manipulation. So what I think the stimulus package is, is it's good. I don't know, you know, it's like kind of giving somebody uh, who's a heroin addict a shot of meths. Sure, it's something a little stronger, but they've been, we've been on this drug of cheap money for a long time, which is why, you know, the Fed, they emergency immediately cut rates in the US to zero. Normally that would be a big deal. The day they did that, mm -hmm. the market still fell because yeah you almost can't let people, you have a corporate debt bubble that's being exposed and you can't just increase the debt to hide that. I think the stimulus package is a good thing because it gives confidence to market that at least people are trying to do things. They're giving money directly to people, uh, which is good because it will help people survive. And to me, that's a lot better. Will that restart things immediately? I don't know. And the big question is going to be, all right, once Corona, let's just say the virus is kind of overish. Let's just say summer's canceled and it's September now, right? September, October. The governments are like, okay, you can start doing things again uh, or maybe kind of limited, like quasi social distancing. So maybe bars can't open, but uh, restaurants, you can seat 20 people, the rest have to be take out. They do some measures to try to open up the economy again. Or let's just say they go, all right, economy's open. Sure, you'll have the initial rush of, oh my God, I've been cooped up inside. Let me go buy every bottle in the club. But a lot of people will have <laughs> lost their jobs. A lot of people will have dipped into their emergency savings. And at some point, unless the government's going to basically turn on universal basic income, once the stimulus ends, we don't know how good the market will keep going. Because once right. they start giving money directly to people, well, they might have to keep up quantitative easing where the government basically just keeps buying physical, or sorry, financial assets. Um, that little crash in 2018 that we recovered from instantly, 
A lot of people think that that's because the Fed suggested they might stop. Market tanked. They're like, oh, okay, we'll keep it going, which to me is terrifying because, you know, we've had a crazy good market. The slight mm -hmm. hint that the government is going to hold our hand tanks the market. Uh, how much of the market gains are real? So the stimulus yeah. practice is a good thing, but America, it might get a lot worse. Coronavirus, unless you do what China did, and once again, yeah. I'm not trying to get political, but you have to choose if you believe their stats and numbers and everything yourself, just like anything. Mm -hmm. um, they hardcore locked down cities. I have yeah. a coworker that was there. One person in his house of four could leave every other day to go get supplies, and they had to have a pass. They would get temperature tested if they left outside their neighborhood. They basically, I mean, dictatorships yeah. and strongman I, I, countries do better in yeah. a virus. America, you have people partying in South Beach. So yeah. even with all this money, I think you'll still see waves of this. And oh. anyone is going to be terrified to get sick. Or if you get in a car accident, you don't want to go to the hospital because you're going to get corona because the hospital's mm -hmm. full. So yeah. it's going to yeah, be terrifying. No, yeah, I, no I, think, I think you're right there. Uh, my brother's in Shanghai right now, and uh, th their lockdown was effective because of what you, you stated. But um, w without, I guess, them actually imposing a real lockdown, it might be quite difficult. Um, I, even myself, I, didn't, I don't want to hear to, you know, the perfect self-isolation. I went for a run today. Uh, but yeah, but we'll see. I guess we'll see in the next couple of months. Anyways, uh, thanks, Renee, for everything. I don't know if anyone else has any other questions, but uh, I, know I appreciate the kind words you gave me earlier. And also, uh, uh, do, do we want to move on that? Yeah, maybe yeah. what we can do is uh, finish off the formal meeting. There's a couple more things to talk about. And then, uh, you know, if people want to drop at that point, we can do that. Uh, but, you know, the rest of us, we can stick around and, and field a couple more questions. Yeah. So what do we got left here? We got yeah. uh, Next one. Renee, announcements. Want these yeah. slides? Yeah, so uh, if you're looking for a copy of these slides, you can just hit the present button, I think. Uh, if you're looking for a copy of these slides, no problem. Uh, so if you're unaware, they basically go out to our entire mailing list a couple of weeks or a week or two after these meetups. So make sure you're on our mailing list. Uh, it's on our, our, our website, uh, volitionprop.com. Uh, at the very bottom, just scroll down, look for this big orange square, put your email address in there, and you'll get you'll get a uh, notification when these slides are ready. Yeah. So I think uh, I'm just looking at my messages. I think Sam just said that he uh, has a sample of, of the type of properties that uh, we find for our clients that uh, he prepared. And I think if you sign up on this list, then... Uh, uh, maybe we'll be firing these off to, to the... Yeah, to, so, you know, uh, on a regular basis, we, we you know, we, we look for deals. Uh, we have actually a couple of good triplex uh, conversion opportunities. Uh, those go out to our active buyers. Uh, so, you know, our active buyers who are on the call tonight, you should be seeing some of these deals come out uh, tonight, tomorrow uh, to you through, through the agents that you're working with. Yep. Yep. Okay, next. Cool. Uh, so as I mentioned earlier, uh, if you're interested in advisory with us, please let us know. You can email us at info at volitionprop.com and we can schedule that 60 minute uh, advisory session with you. Next slide. Yeah. April 15th. So we, we basically delayed this for this meetup uh, until next month, uh, but we'll get back into kind of the regular swing of things on April 15th. Uh, and that's going to be uh, the second part to our February 1st event that we didn't get time really to cover in, in depth. So we'll have our expert panel uh, talking about, you know, their experience investing in Toronto and, you know, hearing it kind of boots from the ground instead of just, you know, me and Matt up here talking. Uh, we'll go through a heat map showing the best areas to invest in Toronto. We'll talk about the various uh, business models that work, you know, why does, what, like, what are the numbers behind these luxury triplex conversions or, reg, or turnkey or condos or pre-con, all these things that we talk about when it comes to investment opportunities here in Toronto, like what are those actual numbers like? Uh, pros and cons and how to actually execute on some of these things. Uh, we'll do case studies and we'll also talk about like how do you get uh, real cash flow, 10K a month type cash flow. Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll, hopefully that'll be, uh, that'll be a great meetup. Yeah, hopefully we'll get through all this stuff. If not, we're gonna have a part three of the quick start. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Next slide. Uh, and again, you know, people have been reaching out to me, but I just want to remind uh, if there's particular subjects that people want to learn about uh, as we go through the year, let me know. If there's things about Corona that you wanted covered that weren't covered, let me know. We can try to discuss them during our next meetup as well.
And we like to end off with a slide. Who can do it? Uh, you can do it. So thanks you very can much, do everybody. it. Thanks, yeah. everybody, for, for hanging around. We're going to stay on the line uh, to continue taking questions. Uh, but if you're, if you're done for the evening, there's been a lot of talking, uh, feel free to drop off now. And thanks again. Hey, Jin just joined. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we're we're done, buddy. We're done. Sliding we're, in at the end there. <laughs> oh, you've been there. <laughs> I didn't see you until you sh until you shared your uh, video. So so uh, yeah. So Jin, here here's a perfect example. Jin, when did you you Jin's been working with Ed? Um, if you don't mind, Jin, uh, do you feel like you're shaking in your boots? And, or, or rather, no. rather, no. why don't why don't you uh, tell us what what you what happened with you in the last couple of weeks or month or whatever, and then tell us whether you feel like you're shaking in your boots. Uh, no, no, no. Can you hear me? Am yep. I on? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Um, no, last this year has been very interesting, like extremely interesting. Um, like first two months, almost three months, the just market was just just dumb, like stupid. Just couldn't so, touch anything. So who who are you working like, with? I was working with this gentleman named uh, Edward Sang, I think. Um, I must say he's, he's not bad. He's not, not bad. He's not Actually, bad. He's a little bit above <laughs> mediocre. <laughs> we we no, haven't seen I'm, each other for two weeks and you forgot my name. I know. I miss you, man. <laughs> <laughs> no, honestly, like, um, like, like, like. Like I, I lost on like five, six deals, and like every single time I'm like, "Fuck, man!" Like Ed, how do you do this shit every single day in and out? It's like I was exhausted, but he kept them going, and um, and I was thoroughly impressed. Um, he knows his stuff, and obviously he's well trained by you guys, and um, and he's got hard work, like really strong work ethic, um, and you know, it just it, and also he he made everything so much more fun to you know do you know it was, a, it was a hard process but you know we we had a lot of fun and you put some fun. context around it sorry to cut you off jim but uh you oh. know a lot of people on the on the call probably don't know you uh um, oh. jin jin is a very experienced real estate investor he has done multifamily conversions he is and he's a i would call you a, a big time developer too he's doing uh townhouse projects uh infill projects commercial development so, you know, Jin is not uh, a newbie to real estate investing by, by any stretch of the imagination. He's actually presented at our meetups before, uh, teaching people how to get into uh, real estate development. So anyway, I wanted to give a bit of that context behind. So if you found it crazy, <laughs> it must have been pretty oh. crazy because you've seen a lot of shit, right? Yeah, absolutely. Like, I mean, I mean I've been kind of, you know... <laughs> I, I just had to start with, I think you guys are in the right place. Um, I took a long path to come back to where I am now. Uh, you know, I, I, in, in, when I first started out, like back in 2007, um, I was sold on cash flow, which is good, but I didn't get the full picture. I was just sold on cash flow, that you need cash flow to get out of your job. So I went to smaller towns and I did a full nine yard and, and learned my lessons. And in the end, you know, I realized that it, it only boils down to two things. Um, any investing, no, real estate investing in particular, is, is it only, it all boils down to one thing, uh, two things. One is that we are in client service business, which means, you know, like, what kind of clients do we want to have? You know, when you're chasing that cash flow out of town, you, you inevitably deal with subpar tenants. And, you know, I was like, I realized that I was running really run down Motel 6, and I wasn't able to collect and there was so much issues to deal with. And, and, I, and I just gave all that up and I said, you know what, I just want to be where I can deal with top clients. Like I want to run, uh, own and operate like Ritz Carlton. So that, what gives that? It's like just Toronto. And also, you know, in the end is like, it's, the building itself doesn't have much value. It's what people can do with that value, that that property creates the value. And, 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 and the real value is, is the land that it's sitting on. So Toronto is the best place for both of these. You get the best clients and you get the best land. And I think um, we're in a very interesting position where we can, you know, back in the days, you know, typically either you had to go for either cash flow or, or appreciation. But I think we are at a very interesting point in history in Toronto where we can um, 
achieve both. Like, you know, you can achieve um, the appreciation by converting, you know, normal house to triplex or more, much higher value property uh, working with Volition Group. But now I think there's an opportunity where you can create more extra cash flow from those properties because it is actually moving up the scale. It's not a stagnant city. So because now, you know, I feel like it's going from B minus to B to B plus and, you know, even A minus and maybe even A. So Toronto is an exciting place. And, and you know, I'm, I'm kind of, after all, everything I've done, I'm coming back to the, the fundamentals. It's about like a land and creating good cash flow and playing for the long term. And, and there's no better place than Toronto. And there's no better time than now than ever. I think the next while it's going to be, there's going to be shake up. And as, um, you know, Matt have mentioned, you just got to play for the long term. The fundamentals haven't changed. Then right now, you know, we have like supply and demand issue and that's not going to change. And, you right. know, no matter what happens to the world, that's still going to remain. So, you know, you just got to stay in it for the long term. And, you know, I think it's, you know, if you're, if you're ready and play it right, there's going to be a lot of opportunity next while. And as you know, and then like for instance, like I'm getting heavily into Airbnb. Now people think that this is the most stupid time, but I, on, on, the, on, the, on the contrary, I think this is a good time because a lot of Airbnbs are falling off the chart because people are freaking out. People are not moving around. Now the, the two buildings got shut down. The, what is that? The ice condo and another condo. There's going to be super duper, like shortage of supply and all the shitty people are falling off the chart and 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 when things are going to kind of starting to loosen up there's going to be you know a lot less good quality products where the people can come and rent on short-term basis so anyways these are things that i can share some other time but you know working with the ad has been fantastic um don't work with him because I got a lot more properties to buy. I got. <laughs> <laughs> what uh, What did you What did you land on yeah. after five or six uh, lost? Actually, actually, lost. Be, actually, before we go into what he landed on, <laughs> I just want to say thank you, Jen, for like the the kind words again. Um, yeah. You know, I'm getting a lot of praises today, and I, you know, it feels pretty good. But um, I, I, I want to say, like, for people who are, who's not aware of what was happening in January and February, the market was insane. Um, there were 10, 20, 30 bids on properties. And they were by people who, I guess, were purchasing based on pure speculation. Uh, pure the numbers, future value. Yeah, pure future value. It's, yeah. Numbers would not make sense in any way. It doesn't matter if you had your mom, father, brother, cousins as electricians and all the trades to do the renovations for you for at price. It just, it didn't make sense. Like, it, like the, the properties we're selling for like double of what the asking was or, or like, you know, 70% higher, 60% higher um, for a full gut. That was a small property it was selling for like 1.6. It just it was ridiculous. Right. Um, and there were trust funds even entering the residential real estate uh, market where they were bidding at a prices that y you, you just can't compete against. Like they're, they're yeah, normal be people can touch it. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. They would be purchasing and c converting the project at a loss. So um, I, I think, I mean, the, the property that we landed on with Jim was a great property first off, but I think in the next Thank coming, you. yeah, no, I mean, you, you can speak for yourself actually. <laughs> I mean, honestly, you, you know, I, I want you to uh, speak for, for yourself because I think, uh, you know, like, that, like how yeah. responsive you were to actually, to see the property on day one of release or actually day zero. And then us like, you know, taking action and taking advantage of an agent who was out of town. Um, you know, it, it was actually very, very fortunate for us too, right? But I, I want to say, like, I think in the next coming months, kind of to Sam's, Ming's, and Matt's point, is that there's there's not going to be this kind of competition right now. People are scared to go out. Um, obviously, when we do go out, we want to protect ourselves, wear gloves, wear masks, wear, wear whatever protective gear that you think is necessary. But there's going to be opportunities where you will be able to maybe get a good investment property or a good bird project, um, a full conversion project, without having to compete against 20 offers or 30 offers. And as long as the fundamentals don't change, the property values will probably continue to climb once this recession, you know, 
uh, fades away. It might be six months from now. It might be a year from now. It might be two months from now. We don't know. I'll tell you right now, one of these conversion projects are not short too. It does take time. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, uh, and right now it takes even longer. The, the city inspectors are, out, they're, they're, not, they're not working until April 5th at least. It might be even longer than that. I think, well, um, like it's, Vinay it knows, like, and there's nothing we can do. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, I think there's going to be a very, very good opportunistic time in a very, very near coming future. And for anyone who's actually interested in investing in real estate and even the stock market, have cash ready. You know, go talk to your mortgage brokers, go talk to buying group and see what you're qualified for. See what you can pull together with your finances. Because when that time does come, the people who are going to be able to take advantage of it are the people who are going to be ready. Yeah. Not the people yeah. who have been sitting on their ass for the past week or two weeks or a month. To, to your point, Ed, yeah. the, the market hasn't died. Like a good asset is not going to sit on the market for like, you know, 20, 30, 40 days. It's a good asset. It's a good asset. And people who are looking for good assets are not limited to the people on this call. Right. Mm. There's a, a lot of people out there hunting for good stuff. So you no, should no, be I, in a position uh, to be ready. Yeah. Yeah. I agree with you. I agree with you there. hundred percent. Um, sorry, uh, I, I know I kind of cut you uh, um, off there, Jen. Um, do, you, do you want to talk about the property or do you want to wait until it's closed uh, sure. before you right. want to talk about it? No, with Ed, it's like I, I lost some on, on like five properties and they were just, just being more. like, I was, I was yeah, I, on three of or four of those, I, I was like the second one. Like I just lost them by just a tiny bit. But um, people are paying kind of prices that just, we couldn't go because just numbers didn't work and all the obvious ones were just like you're competing with people who had a lot deeper pocket than, than, than myself or have a lot less common sense or they were just purely buying on future value and like you know I don't I don't have unlimited fund and I'm working with other investors the numbers gotta work um, but the obvious ones were like getting picked up and there was like 20 30 bids and I just couldn't compete but um, 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 this particular property that, that, that ad flagged me to take a look, um, I didn't think much of it. Um, when I saw the listings and, you know, I, when I was even walking up to the property, I'm like, hey, it's a good location, but didn't think too much of it until I started walking the full length of the house. And I, I started, I, I called ad right away. Sorry, like, Jin, did, did, you, did, 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 <laughs> Jin, did you cut out for everyone? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. About, uh, we need about five. Rewind about five or ten seconds. No, he just basically said he uh, okay. he told he, he just told me what the hell is this? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No. No. Yeah. Yeah. I started. I, I so started you, walking along the building, and I'm like, I started realize that this building, this property, just did not end. Like, there's no backyard, and the house kept on going. And at the end of the house, there was a garage which was just attached to the house, and mm. I'm like. This is a very strange property. I got to go inside. I started walking inside. I'm like, each floor is like 1,000 square foot. Um, even the basement had a full length, 1,000 square foot. And upstairs was done immaculate. It's like out of a magazine state. It was an owner's suite. The main floor didn't show too well. Basement, it was just, you know, this was basement. wasn't well utilized. And, and, and there's a garage um, which had an access to the laneway. Um, but people kind of, you know, on the listing, it didn't, you know, I think people are mostly looking for properties that were just easily convertible to multiplex plus laneway potential. But did this one did not present it that way. So, you know, once I wa was inside, it's like it became very, like, obvious really fast that, you know, it's a project that we can turn around really fast. Like upstairs, we didn't have to touch anything. Main floor, just move a couple walls, paint, some furniture, up good to go within a month. The only thing that we really need to do was um, underpin the basement and I want to convert the garage to kind of living unit. So, you know, about two, two fifty, I can get the whole job done within six months. Like, and it can increase the value substantially. And it was going to produce about $11,000 in, in, in monthly gross rent. So it was like, I'm like, add, call them up. Let's, let's make an offer now. So, yeah. 
No, it's great. Like that's it's, it's, it's uh, and, and like I think the really cool part was like because the, the garage actually had a bathroom in the garage, so it had proper yep. drainage and everything. So it was one of those properties where it, it was we, we got a day zero. So um, as soon as they hit the market, so we got uh, so we did act quick. It was one of those properties where you know if, if it it did have proper showings and uh, everything else, it might have been taken off the market before anyone else was able. I mean, uh, it might have went to bidding wars and went for a little bit over ask, or quite a lot more over asking. Um, but yeah. Anyways, uh, I, I think people have some questions right now too, right, Matt? Yeah, I actually, I just want to add on to that. So uh -huh. there's a couple of key takeaways that I, I just want to uh, quickly um, highlight. So, I mean, one of the things that we pride ourselves here at Volition is being able to see value where others can't, right? Um, you know, uh, whether that be, you know, uh, the opportunity for laneway housing or the opportunity because we see a larger floor plate being able to rearrange that, uh, or maybe we, because we see a bathroom uh, already there, which means the, dr the plumbing and the drainage is already there. Like we see things that normal people don't. Uh, we also jump on opportunities where, um, you know, uh, the properties aren't being listed properly. They're being listed inaccurately or um, they're not being presented in, in a way that um, most people aren't going to be able to see past what's directly in front of them. Um, so, I mean, that was one major component of why this is a big win. The other major component is acting fast. So, you know, day zero, like this thing has barely... Like it hasn't even, it hasn't even been mailed out to uh, most agents are going to set you up on a, on a um, auto MLS listing. So it means, you know, today listing goes live tomorrow or around midnight tonight, it goes out or tomorrow goes out to everyone. We're in there today <laughs> because we're constantly monitoring. So within the hour of it going live, we can get in there before anyone else can. And if you're, if you're nimble enough and you can act fast enough, you can secure these things before anyone else has even seen them, right? So those are the types of things that's, that are important in, in still being able to get the upper hand. Everyone thinks that it's a level playing field. It's a level playing field if you're working with dumbass agent who acts slowly, who, who can't see beyond what's in front of, what's in front of them. Uh, but all of these things combined, you know, taking advantage of, of agents who don't know what the hell they're doing, like listing agents, uh, taking advantage of 905 agents who think they can list in the 416, right? There's a whole, it's a different ball game. And if we can, if we can, if we can take advantage of these things, uh, then it doesn't, it's not a necessarily a, a level playing field and we'll have the upper hand. So there's just a couple of things I wanted to, I wanted to call out uh, and, and pull out from this example. Uh, no, for sure. Like just wanted to quickly mention, it's like, it's like someone like Ed was invaluable because, you know, he, he just, Toronto is not only about like, the neighborhood and sometimes it's like street by street and, and really understanding uh, the demographics and the demand and, and the rent um, is crucial in making that decision. And, and you guys bring that with a, with like spades, so. Yeah, I mean, you. Yeah, you, 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 you can't be like, uh, oh, look at a property, or, or look at a property and going, oh, how much is it gonna rent for? Oh, uh, let me go pull some comps and get back to you. No, <laughs> yeah. it, does, it doesn't work like that. You have to be, like, you have to be knowledgeable. You have to know neighborhood by neighborhood, street by street, and you have to be able to uh, have that information immediately back, uh, top of mind so that you can pull these triggers very quickly. So that's good. Uh, okay. Yeah, let's let's move on. As much as love hearing praises, <laughs> uh, this is this is this is great. This is great for me. But yeah, let's let's. Uh, I know we have some questions. Did we have questions? I don't know. Ming, I think so. What would you see on the, on the group chat? It's like it's. I think the chat's going crazy right now. So okay, what well, what are what are some of the questions? Oh, it's mainly thank. It's actually mainly thank yous. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, thank I don't yous. see any questions. But yeah. uh, does any oh. does anybody have any questions for for? Myself, Matt, Hugo's in line, uh, Vinay's still in line too. Okay. okay. Well, well, I don't think we have anything. So okay. that's, uh, well, well, while we, I don't know, while we scan the, the list or while people are thinking about their questions, I actually just want to make a comment. Thanks for the feedback. It actually does mean a lot because I'll be honest. Um, 
while we were putting this together, we were like, mm, I actually thought people are going to be like, people are going to tune in because they're going to want to know from us what's going to happen with the market. You know, uh, when, when should we buy? When's a good time? And I wanted to, you know, I want, I, I pondered on this for a long time before we put together a content for this meetup where we wanted to reframe this conversation. Um, not about, I, I didn't want it to be about, you know, when's a good time, you know, uh, how far is it going to drop? How long is this thing going to last? We don't have those answers, but what we, how we wanted to frame the conversation is, is what should we do during this time to play defense, to protect yourself, to ensure that we can hold for the long term because we know the long term is where it's going to be, uh, where we want to be. Um, so anyway, it, the fact that you guys found, found this valuable and, you know, thank you for the kind words. It does mean a lot because it does, it does give us some semblance of, or an indication that we're at least answering the questions that are top of mind for you and that we're hitting the right points. So that's good. Thanks. Were there any questions? Oh, Hugo. Uh, what is the process and cost involved to set up a HELOC? Um, I can probably just answer that. It's probably easier than typing it. So um, if you've got a mortgage already, and you're, the cheapest way to do it is just reach out to your existing lender and see if they'll allow you to add a HELOC without impacting your existing mortgage. And if they do allow it, then you've just avoided a huge mortgage penalty potentially. But generally the costs are uh, the appraisal, so maybe 300 bucks or more, three to 400 bucks, and the cost of legals, which the bank will normally subsidize for 600. So for under a thousand bucks, you could do the appraisal of the legals. Some banks will pay for all that stuff. Don't expect it you know, to be paid for, but you know, that, that's, those are the two costs actually involved with setting it up. But if you're looking at adding a HELOC, it might be worthwhile seeing if you might as well just refinance and restructure everything and take advantage of the rates and re-amortizing back to 30 years and that sort of thing. But if you have a mortgage, it's a good rate. You can't really do much of the amortization. You just want to add a HELOC. Just call your existing bank, see if that's possible without a penalty. And for under a thousand bucks, you can normally set it up and get that done. Cool. Thanks. Um, Oh, one thing I I I, I typed a note in this uh, in the chat. Uh, we referred to our mailing list a little bit, and we said, you know, we send out to our active clients, blah 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 blah. If you want to sign up, uh, if you're not already on our mailing list, um, you can go to our website, um, which is volitionprop.com. You can sign up there, or you can send us a note at info at volitionprop.com. So I put some of those details in the chat. Um, and I think uh, Sam has pulled together some some stuff that uh, that I think we we might be sending out to our list uh, later tonight or tomorrow. Yeah, we haven't been thank you. we haven't been that active uh, on our list, and it's mainly because if it it doesn't go out to our list because we have active buyers, <laughs> so our active buyers get uh, first dibs. The people we're actively working with, and and then it goes out to the list if uh, if no one's actually pulling the trigger. So that's why you're not seeing stuff on the list. If you're if you're wondering why you don't see a lot, it's because you're not working with us actively. <laughs> uh, but I think that tonight's going to be an exception, and Sam has pulled together some stuff that we'll send out. <laughs> Any it's other questions? Out tonight. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? Was there uh, there were some early questions early on. Do we want to address them or? I don't know. What do you want to do? Rob might have dropped already. <laughs> we're, we're, we're down to 41 participants. So let's end it now. And, yeah. uh, you know, people know how to get a hold of us if they have any other questions. And yeah. Thank you, everybody, for joining. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you, guys. Thank okay. you. Yep. Bye, right. guys. Have a good night, everyone. Peace out. Thanks, Hugo. Thanks, Vinay. Thank I uh, appreciate, Thanks, pre appreciate the insight. So Vinay, we're gonna get your face up on the uh, on our on a, on the volition <laughs> greeters list, <laughs> and uh, we'll get you we'll get you one of those name tags too. I guess. Thank you. Yep. I'm gonna go have dinner now. <laughs> yeah, that's a good call. Uh, I guess. Oh, Joseph had a had a a question. Any other okay. any other book re recommendations? Um, the other one is uh, Secrets of the Canadian Real Estate Cycle is the one I said. Uh, the other one is Real Estate Investing in Canada 2.0. That's sort of the, um, the kind of standard um, book that people get started with. So that's the other one. Uh, this one. Oh, 
<laughs> um, how to win friends and influence people. That's a fantastic book. It's a, it is a, it is actually a very, very good book. Um, that's so, Hey, <laughs> that's so funny. Hey, Ed, did you see what Joseph just uh, showed? What? No, I didn't see. Look. Ah, great book. Oh my One God. of my favorite you, books. It's guys, my second time reading it right now. You guys, you guys are like book buddies. Yeah, yeah. I have, I have, I a, small, believe, I have, a, small, I have a small pile right there I need to go through. I can't believe you guys literally had the same book showing each other. Um, then The Intelligent Investor. And uh, I think trading psychology two point yeah yeah that one's a pretty 